Call the, call the meeting to order. Zach, would you lead us in the pledge? Please rise, put your hand over your heart. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. At this time, we'll observe a moment of silence. Madam Secretary, call the roll. Sheevy? Here. Breckis? Here. Zadra? Here. Delgado? Here. Dorch? Here. Jardin? Here. Cashel? Here. We'll go to public comment. Uh, Barbara Pratt? Uh, Bar is it Barbara? Pratt? Is there a barber in the house that wanted to speak? I can't read your last name. More services available for seniors, especially food bank. Donna Klontz. Good morning, uh, council members, city manager, and uh, guests. I'm Donna Klontz. I am chair of the Reno Senior Citizen Advisory Board for the city of Reno. And um, we are a group that has been very active in the community as volunteers to advise the council and, and advise uh, the, the uh, programs for seniors here in the, in, in the city of Reno. Um, as members of this very large population of senior citizens that are here in the city of Reno. Uh, we're in the midst of Older Americans Month right now, and I have, I've been attending some of the events. And yesterday, there was an event at Neal Road that is called the Conversation Cafe. And we had to cancel the, the speaker there who was from Crisis Call Center because they were involved in an, in an emergency responder training yesterday that most of the emergency responders in the county were involved in. So I went to talk to the seniors that had come to hear them and to talk to them about senior programs and their feelings about what the city of Reno was doing for them as seniors. And I want to tell you about these two wonderful senior ladies who came into the room on walkers together. They were great friends, they said. One lady said you could tell that she was disabled, that she, that she comes on the bus, um, and that Without the programs at the, at the senior center, she would have no place to go every day. She comes and gets a hot meal there. She participates in the, in the classes together, and she helps her friend who was sitting across the room from her. And this other lady um, looked like my grandmother. She was this lovely gray-haired lady, and she said, you can't tell by looking at me, but I have, a very, I have a silent and a very serious disease. She said, I have Alzheimer's. And I come on the access bus with my friend, and together we participate in the program. She said, my, you're saving my life by the programs that you present at your senior centers. So I know that the city is, is, is 
planning to continue the senior programs here, but I wanted to tell you how important they really are. They're, they, they are a lot of fun for a lot of seniors, but they provide that engagement and that ability to stay healthy just by coming out of the house and participating every day. Um, I put a, a, some facts that I wanted you to think about, and we did meet with, this, with the city manager um, on Monday, Marcy Kupfersmith and I. The Senior Advisory Committee gets a, about a little over $30,000 in the budget this year to be able to give back to our senior programs and to support things like Older Americans Month and Senior Games. And the manager said that he, after listening to the things that we told him about seniors, he said, I will, and we found out we weren't in the budget at all, that he, he would he would make sure that we were back in the, in the budget. And I understand that that has happened. I'm hoping that's true, but I know you all as council will make the final decision about what will happen. So I'm urging you to, to follow that lead and please leave us in the budget. The statistics on the, on the board um, show that we are this large, large group. We volunteered over 4,000 4, hours to the city of Reno. Actually, that's conservative. We've done a lot more. That's mainly Senior Games, Older Americans Month, and the seniors that are at the centers doing volunteer hours. Our partners, some of them are here in the, in the community. And as volunteers, we add to that quality of life and enhance what goes on in the city of Reno. We're proud to be your partners. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Klinger. Mr. Mayor, I just, I just want to clarify. When I spoke with Mrs. Klontz, um, I was under the impression that the, the funding for the uh, seniors had been taken out of the budget. It actually had been moved to a different location. And so they were budgeted 27000 last year. Mr. Mayor, I believe you gave 5000 of your funds to them for a total of thirty two. So they are currently budgeted at that same level of 32000 Good. Thank you, Andrew. You don't want to see me go sideways on this issue. <laughs> Take care of us old folks. Exactly. <laughs> I think your numbers are a little low, Ms. Klontz. Uh, there's more of us over 60, but that's okay. No, I don't need a comment. Um, Nick Sharp. Good morning. Uh, Nick Sharp. I'm fairly new to the area. Moved here from Colorado last fall. Um, Welcome and uh, having a good time here. Um, my wife and I were uh, on the Reno Senior Games Committee uh, in charge of the pickleball this last spring, and we have one coming up in the fall, of course, in August. And uh, for all you who don't know, this is a pickleball paddle, and this is a ball. And this is what we used to play on a court half the size of a tennis court. Um, we had 45 participants in the senior games this last spring. That was the largest um, group in the senior games this year um, of all the different sports that were participating in. We hope to add at least 25 or 30 percent of that this fall. Um, just in reference to that, we started with 80, this is according to Bill Ball's number, who is the ambassador at Neal Road. We started with 80 participants or 80 uh, pickleball players on his list of players in town uh, last, uh, last senior game last fall, and we are now at 145. It's not a huge number, but that's a pretty big increase for uh, those kind of numbers that we're looking at. Um, and just in reference to that, uh, the Huntsman Senior Games in St. George, which probably most of you are familiar with, started the same way, and it now has over 400 pickleball players that show up over a two-week period. So it, it's got quite a lot of uh, upside to it. It's the largest growing sport in the United States because it's attended mostly by senior citizens, and we happen to be the largest group, I believe, it nowadays anyway. So, um, and I just wanted to, in reference, say the... Uh, Senior services have been very um, helpful with uh, all of uh, the pickleball uh, courts and uh, helping to improve the facilities. We have courts in Neal Road and Evelyn Mount now, as well as three locations outside. So we're able to play summer and winter, which is pretty important if you're going to play serious sports. Uh, we have a lot of traveling uh, tournament players as well now. Uh, we have one coming up in August. 
uh, I mean, uh, next month in uh, Auburn, and then my wife and I are also playing in one in uh, Sonoma in about a month and a half. So um, as we travel, we spread the word that we're having senior games here, and we want to uh, try to up that each and every time so our numbers grow. And without the support of um, senior services, uh, Daryl and Alan, um, we wouldn't be getting uh, that kind of help to be able to uh, expand this and to spread Reno's senior games and pickleball in the area. So thank you. Thank you. Sam Denae. Good morning, City Council and Mr. Predecessor Mayor to the Marine Corps veteran who will be the next mayor of Reno if there's an honest vote count. I'm Sam Dene, the Encyclopedia of Reno Government, and the father of Reno's next mayor, if there is an honest vote count. And uh, as far as that pickleball, what a great little sport that is. And by the way, let's not confuse that pickleball game, which is a great thing, with the terrible financial pickle that the Reno City Council and the media have gotten this community into. Pickleball's good. Financial pickles are not good. And by the way, the Reno Gazette is now the official most disgusting newspaper in the world. This latest freaky scheme that they're perpetrating where they think they can go out and print a bunch of ballots. I mean, Central America and Nigeria wouldn't even go that far. Printing all of these phony ballots to decide who should get, who should be Reno mayor. All you can do is conjure up something like, okay, I got all, the, that guy over there's got all these campaign contribution bribes coming in. Hey, let's take the bribes and buy all the newspapers and take all those ballots out and vote for our boy. Let's vote for our boy. Suddenly he's number one. <laughs> I hope the citizens of Reno are not so stupid, fickle, and dumb to fall for that scheme. As I say, if we don't get an honest vote count from the real vote counters, it doesn't even matter anyway. But anyway, the Reno Gazette finally had the gumption with a little prompting from Sam, the a gumption to sit down with Sam, me, for a little briefing yesterday. Right here, the lady wanted to know, where would you like to meet? And I said, how about at my office? And she said, okay, great, where's that? It's down at the city hall building. So we met right over there and talked for a while. I gave her the benefit of the doubt. I said, let's make believe. Let's make believe. Oh, hi, George. Good to see you here. Hey, how's the family doing over there? Come on down here more often. Hey, come up here and talk to the mayor. He likes to hear from you. Hey, hey, there's Fred over there, too. Hi, buddy. How you doing? Hey, glad, glad you came down to the Sam Denae show. At any rate, so I sat down with this young lady, and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this premise for us. I'm going to make believe that you were either down in a cave for the last 20 years or out in some Pacific island secluded from the whole world and you don't know anything about Sam Dene because if you don't know anything about Sam Dene, you should not be a reporter. There should not be a Reno. And oh, and then she got really upset because the number one, the number two proverb on the, the Dene gospel, the number two proverb is to dismantle the Reno Gazette. Oh, did she get upset about that? And I said, well, we're going to dismantle it from the viewpoint of you've got a bad car that doesn't work anymore, and you need a new, the generator doesn't gen, and the sparks don't spark, and the pistons don't go up and down, then nice chortle. We're going to replace all that stuff, and we're going to get new parts, including new reporters, but I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to give you guys a six-month reprieve to try to rejuvenate yourselves. Oh, thank you very much. We're going to close the public comment section. At this time, I would like for everybody to rise because we need to sing happy birthday to one of our colleagues. <laughs> Mrs. Zadra had a birthday yesterday. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sharon. Happy birthday, Sharon. Mr. Mayor, I thought you were more reliable. 
<laughs> us, us over 55ers, um, the senior group, need to stick together and not recognize those days, especially in public. I but thank you. I didn't name. I didn't name your date or anything. You did. All right. Approval of the agenda. Anybody want to pull anything or discuss? Move for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those that oppose, no. Motion carries unanimously. We, um, we think we'll be through by 11, but we didn't uh, bring in lunch today. If we're not through, we'll take a two-hour recess and reconvene at 1 o'clock if we're going past 11 o'clock. So if it gets to 11, we will reconvene and uh, come back at 1 o'clock uh, to finish it up. All right, now we'll go to item F1. We have a couple of people who wish to speak. Mr. Dene. Sam Dene, the Encyclopedia of Reno Government. And for the folks who don't know it, out in TV land and on U Sam's YouTube channel, we're discussing the almighty budget of Reno, Nevada today. And apparently, probably, potentially going to, those folks up there are going to approve the budget. And this budget is really a rather dastardly thing, just like it has been every year, financially speaking, every year, the way it's been every year since Sam came to these podiums and started warning you and, and advising you about ways to not have the budget be such a pickle. Nothing against the pickleball. That's a great game. At any rate, I have come to these podiums year after year after year, and I'm getting the solemn looks on the face up there at the dais because they know I'm telling the truth, and they know that Sam hates to say I told you so. I really hate to say I told you so because when I say I told you so, it means that the citizens out there, the citizens out there, hey, hi, Fred, how you doing over there? The citizens out there are... Um, they're the ones who are suffering. These folks are still getting their bloated salaries and retirement funds and all of that stuff. None of that's going away. They've got nothing to worry about. They're living up on the 15th floor of this beautiful building with the, uh, well, apparently it's not caviar anymore, somebody told me. They, they switched to pate or something like that. I don't even know what. At any rate, the, the, science, Sam has warned you about these things over and over and advised you. I'm an idea man. I once put together a scheme, <laughs> a procedure for the B-52 bomber in the Air Force that saved the nation, and it didn't cost anything, and it saved the nation over a billion dollars. I've got ideas, and I've had more ideas from this community than all these people added together. I do not, I'm not infested with paralysis of habit like so many of our bureaucrats are. I come down here, and I do it all. Do you think I'm a paid lobbyist? <laughs> Some people say I must, how do you keep coming down here? You must be a paid lobbyist. No, I do everything philanthropically, just out of my heart. And so back to square one, the purpose of government is to protect the citizens. So the, number, the, the two organizations in the community that should get the highest ranking are the law enforcement people and the fire department people. And so what do we have taking place today, or this week, or last week, or next week? You're going to lay off 35 firemen. And I warned you about that, not specifically, but generally, when you spent $50 million buying and refurbishing this lavish building so you could aggrandize yourselves and live up there when we had a perfectly good city council building over there just going lying dormant for all those years until finally I talked to you into and making it a children's museum. I mean, just think, it's just so disgusting. Those 35 firemen, they must be just going, and their wives and families must just be going berserk thinking about this building. And by the way, closing out, I am very, very disappointed in the fire department union. Instead of choosing Sam as their um, nominee slash candidate, as endorsee, they picked somebody else. There's no way anybody has done more for the fire department than Sam Denae. And I can bet those Rank and file guys will vote for Sam. Thank you. Huh. Let me think of where I am. Yes, I have some more people wishing. Uh, Harmon. Good 
Good morning, Council Members. My name is Jacob Harmon. I'm the Regional Director of the Alzheimer's Association here in Reno, uh, and we serve all 66,000 square miles of northern Nevada. Um, I'm here to talk about the public-private partnership uh, that Reno has, in a lot of ways, exemplified in order to serve our senior citizens. Um, we have an infrastructure in this town, in this community, that serves seniors um, make sure that they are getting the proper uh, access to care that they need to keep them aging in place at home and with dignity. And the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee is a vital part of that partnership. And uh, the city manager talked that they're still in the budget. I think that's great. Um, I'd like for the city council to consider expanding senior citizen uh, resources because we have a cadre of really devoted community-based services who are eager to partner with uh, the public in order to ensure that our seniors get the care that they need. Thank you for hearing me. it's important to me that the social senior programs continue. Uh, Venetia Dixon, are you still here? Good morning. I'd just like to say that I am a volunteer for the SHIP and SMP, as well as a member of the Reno Senior Citizens Advisory Committee. It is important that we do continue to fund the senior centers, senior services. Not only are they the backbone of the community, but as well as it also lessens the cost for the city and the county in actual support services, as well as long-term care costs. It's very expensive. I've taken the opportunity to tour some of these facilities, and it is costly, and those people do rather stay at home. So if we can get the, the seniors to be engaged in activities and to keep them healthy, I think we'll all be happy in the long run. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Curtis Rowe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Uh, my name is Curtis Rowe. I am currently the chairman of BFAC, uh, Building, uh, uh, Building Enterprise Fund Advisory Committee. <clears throat> a year ago, you tasked us, uh, I'm speaking on the uh, alignment of community development fees. I guess I'll go back and say that. But a year ago, you asked us to look and evaluate uh, the fees and processes affected by community development. <clears throat> we took uh, a lot of time, including nine public meetings, uh, evaluated the service versus the amount of required staff time, and then also a comparison of competing jurisdictions to look at these fees and processes. Um, what we came through through this year-long process is a proposal you have in front of you today. Uh, we basically feel that this makes us more competitive in the marketplace and is more reasonable and aligns the fees to make Arena more competitive. We ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, item F1, Mr. Klinger. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, before we jump into the presentation, um, I just wanted to say to, to the council this morning, this is the last scheduled um, budget workshop that we have before final adoption. Um, so unless we come to final decisions today, we would likely have to schedule another time to uh, for a workshop. So I guess what I'm what I'm asking council is that as we go through the budget today, what would what we would be asking is that what you do today is your final decision. So I would ask that at least a majority of the council weigh in on whatever decisions are made today, so that when we move forward to the 20th, the 20th really becomes just the final adoption, and we're not debating on what should or shouldn't be in the budget. Okay. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. Go ahead. Where are we starting? 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, Mr. Manager. I'm Kate Thomas with the Office of Management and Budget here to present for you the fiscal year 15 recommended budget and follow up items from the previous budget workshop and city council meetings that we recently encountered. Today's agenda, and we're going to take this first bullet a little bit out of order. Um, today's agenda, we're hoping to go over the follow up items from the April 23rd workshop that we all had in this very room, as well as go through a little more in depth discussion on the 1415 fee schedule that's being proposed. We'll talk about the redevelopment agency budgets, and then finally, we'll end with the Think Reno 2035 presentation so you can talk a bit more about where we're headed with the master planning and strategic envisioning processes. Pardon me as I skip through the first couple of slides that I mentioned we'll come back to. So at our last meeting, there was a lot of discussion around public safety. I wanted to show that the budget that we're presenting for fiscal 15 strikes that balance between fiscal stability and public safety. So the chart that you're seeing here depicts the public safety as far as police, fire, and then not to be forgotten are other or organizational parts of the city that include public works, um, the municipal court system, we've got dispatch, all those other components are the city's commitment to public safety, and those are shown here um, the other departments includes the dispatch, but those are shown here as far as the level of service that's being performed and the level of expenditures that are being committed to by the council around public safety. That being said, at the last city council um, budget workshop and then subsequently at the council meeting that was on the 30th of April, City Manager was given direction to go forward and try to identify resources to fund potentially additional fire positions. Um, we had originally, for your edification, proposed the funding of 15 general fund fire positions in the budget. Um, after some more research, it was discovered that there were some revenue alignments that could be done as far as taking the revenue coming in from the fire only inspections that are currently being conducted and allocating those revenues to the fire department as an ongoing resource that would not further incur fiscal year 16 to be in worse shape than we already project it to be. So those building enterprise revenues will go towards the um, inspection positions that we have which then in turn offsets general fund resources so that we can retain two additional firefighters bringing our number that will be ongoing funded through the general fund to 17. When do we ask when do we ask? Ask a question. Uh, I mean, I appreciate what you're doing, but what does that do for us? It doesn't open another station. I don't I don't recall us asking you to do this. Mayor and Council, this was just based on discussion that was had at the last budget workshop. Um, there were some comments made from members about, you know, let's see what we can do to find additional resources to fund additional positions. And this will not, you're, you're correct, Councilman, this will not open up another fire station, but it, what, will it, what it will do is it will add to the um, floater positions that we have. We're currently slated to have nine per shift. This would add two more floaters to that rotation to cover both sick leave and vacation leave. And again, this is, this is partly why I said in the beginning what I did. We need to make sure we get clear direction from a majority of the council today on what you want us to do because there was a lot of discussion last time, but it was, it was never sort of formalized into specific motions. So we took all of that direction that was given from everybody on the council, and this is, this is what we brought forward today. Um, I have a question. Um, so this funding for these additional two fire positions, this is based upon the, the million dollar per year savings from the building? No, this was uh, upon the direction that we go forward and try to fi find additional resources. This was uh, taking the building enterprise functions that the fire department currently performs around inspections and recognizing that the revenue that was going into the building enterprise fund was not being allocated to the fire department for those fire only inspections. And so this is taking a look at where were there additional ongoing resources that again wouldn't further us in fiscal 16 
um, you know, not taking away from existing programs, so forth. This is those funds that were identified to offset general fund to allow for the addition of the two resources. Okay. Um, can I just read something from the Financial Advisory Board because maybe you can clarify for me. Sure. Um, the Financial Advisory Board advised that the $1 million in fiscal year 2015 savings from the payoff of the City Hall building debt should go to contingency to cover the projected losses in fiscal year 2016 and not be used to fund the proposed increase in new ongoing expenditures. Uh, new fire. The city should not incur the remaining proposed 1.2 million increase in new ongoing expenditures given the projected shortfall in 2016 and retention of the fire positions affected by the loss of the SAFER grant should be funded by savings generated by the Reno Fire Department and this motion carried um, with the Financial Advisory Board. So were they not clear on the funding of these additional two or, or are we talking about The presentation more? to the Financial Advisory Board was prior to this additional direction that came, actually the last council meeting when we went through the directions in force. Um, that is obviously a recommendation from a group that is advisory to the city council. You know, what you choose to do with that direction is certainly up to your, to your privy. Mr. Okay, Mayor, so if I may be recognized. Um, I understand the budgetary implications of this. It comes from the Enterprise Fund, which is governed by state law. I was involved in most of the meetings, Mr. Rowe, said were, you know, the public review of the enterprise fund. And I, I see what you've done. You know, these fire positions, as I understand it, are ones who are doing services related to the building permit fees that are paid. So I see the nexus. And from my perspective, um, you know, whether or not it opens a fire station or not, if it relieves the general fund to allow more firefighting resources out there, that is a good thing. I, I don't, um, you know, I was very struck by the chief's statement last week when I asked if c citizens of Reno are going to be safe with these layoffs, and he had a, uh, said that's a tough question to answer. So to me, any resources uh, that we can provide, uh, boning up this um, is, is pos in the positive direction, because I am concerned about these cuts. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I, I disagree. I, I mean, to, to put, to hire, to keep these two additional firefighters on that does nothing to benefit public safety is, to me, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's just irresponsible. So you're saying I, that two additional firefighters does nothing to improve public safety? Right, because we're not opening another fire station. We're not, we're, we're, the resources aren't. I'd like to hear from the chief. Like fire truck then, no. like the wheels maybe is how you'd say you need a fire Let's truck. hear from the chief. Let's not be arguing with ourselves. Mr. Mayor, for the record, Mike Hernandez, fire chief. Any additional personnel will go into the floater pool, which will offset overtime, which will offset, they, uh, we're going to have X number of people that can take vacation. So if we've got appropriate number of personnel to offset that number of people that are on vacation or on sick leave, that would reduce uh, the general fund. Uh, demand with respect to overtime. So whether it's one, 21, 35, you know, one person, uh, you know, and, and we, we, I, I can understand Council Member Dorch's concern, you know, one doesn't or two doesn't open a station, that's correct, but it does add to our pool of floaters that will offset vacancies. That's the but, bottom line. But does it offset it to the tune of $250,000 that is going to cost us to hire these two firefighters, to keep these two firefighters? I mean, does it, does it offset, I mean, it basically, right, does it offset the overtime by $250,000? And if it oh, does, oh. then why don't we keep five? I mean, there's, I mean there, there's a reason we're laying people off because we don't have the money. Correct. And it's what you're telling me is that, that by keeping these two on, it's going to reduce overtime. If that's the case, why don't we keep five and reduce overtime by their salaries too? Okay, let's keep five. Well, I, Mr. Mayor, if I may be recognized, this is essentially a shift of funding from the enterprise fund that can be justified. Five, I think, I, I assume you've done the analysis, and five could not be justified under the enterprise. When someone pulls a building permit, someone from the fire department goes and makes sure that there has been um, compliance with fire regulations. They have that expertise. Staff found out that the general fund was doing that service and found that within the statutory framework, the money can be used from the building enterprise for this function. That relieves then the general fund to fund the firefighters. I think it's, it's um, a responsible way to do it. But we could still use those funds to offset firefighter costs and put the other money back in the general fund. Um, oh, 
the, one Wait a of the, you can still just to clarify. Wait a minute, y'all. Y'all got a debate meeting, going down here. Let's cool it. The lady here speaking. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in the last meeting that we had with Fire, they had mentioned, I think it was 731, mentioned that they had taken concessions. Do you, what were those concessions? Robert. Thank you. Do you remember that? Okay. Uh, Robert Chisel, uh, Director of Finance and Administration. I believe it was about two and a third percent payroll cut, permanent concession. So what, what is that average to? I'm just... Uh, you know, a, a, again, it depends on what their position is and what they what they're at. But if oh, here's somebody can answer the question. <laughs> For the record, Michelle Hobbs, Admin Services Manager, of the Reno Fire Department. Back in 2011, the Reno Fire Department (IAFF) Local 731 came forward with concessions. Part of those concessions included a 3.87 salary, salary and benefit reduction, which amounted to just over a little mil over a million dollars. Those were ongoing costs. Those costs are not going to sunset. They are ongoing, um, and they continued with those costs even through today. They also um, removed some EMT incentive to about $429,000. And the total of those costs was about $1.5 million in ongoing reductions. Permanent. Okay. Permanent. 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 Do those, where do those funds go? Do they go back into the fire budget? Do they go, where do they go? Back in the general fund? Where, general. Where, do, where do they go? For the record, Kate Thomas. Those were part of the concessions that were built in to bu balance the budget when we were going through the, the difficult financial times. So those go into the general fund. <clears throat> Shouldn't they go back into fire? Uh, most most areas gave concessions, uh, including unrepresented and so forth. So all of those concessions were used to balance the budget at that time. Okay, so that that is permanent. I want to make that clear. It's permanent. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. A yes. lot. Um, I have a question. Do we have a um, a calculation of what the overtime impacts will be related to? Um, these two positions, and I think this is kind of playing um, further to what Mr. Dorch, Dorch's question was. And the, it, it is, we, it was set on record that these two additional positions don't make the city any safer. It doesn't open another station. It, it may, however, relieve um, some impacts relative to overtime. Do we have that correlation? We don't have that. Um, for the record, Mike Hernandez, Fire Chief. Our overtime calculation is ultimately going to be determined based on vacancies that are taken on a day-to-day -day or a shift-to-shift -shift basis. Currently, the way our staffing plan exists after July 1, we will have 183 people assigned to the entire, the boots on the ground. That's 61 people per shift, 61. There will be nine floaters. Based on that calculation, there will be 12 vacancies every shift. So we will be, if everybody takes vacation, we will be in an overtime situation unless we either close another unit, an engine, uh, or, or hire back on overtime. Now, there are times, today's a classic example, when nobody took vacation. That vacation ratio, there's no standard set number of people that can take, there's a, a fixed number of people that can take vacation. Whether or not the, the membership or the, or the crews elect to take vacation is dependent on each day. It goes up and down. Uh, so in order to calculate, to get a firm number, we would have to probably do a, either a two or a three year back analysis based on the number of people that have taken vacation. Typically, it's about anywhere from 8 to 12 percent, possibly even as high as 15 percent. But that vacation formula adjusts based on the number of people that are in the department. It's one-sixth plus two. So come July 1, one-sixth plus two equals 12 positions. Mr. Mayor, too, if I, if I might add just one comment to the discussion. The other thing that it does is it, it, you know, adding two obviously does not open up another station, but depending on how many vacation slots are used, depending on how much sick leave is used, it may prevent us from browning out another truck. In other words, if we're within two and we have these two positions, it possibly print, you know, prevents us from browning out um, another apparatus. So just so council can consider everything. Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. Uh, and I know we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, but with the two, saving two, 
in addition to possible retirements and what that's going to mean for more numbers as firefighters, is that going to mean that there's a possibility of opening up another fire station and making it easier, that much more easier? Well, Reno Fire Chief Mike Hernandez. The, the, the retirement number is, com is a separate discussion with our, sure. what our staffing is going to look like at the end of July or at the beginning of July 1. That's not going to change with the exception of these two added positions if council elects to move on this. So uh, that will not open. To the short answer to your question is it's not going to open up another station. We, we but all we're, on yeah, all we're doing with is, is we're the people at the, at the top end of the seniority mm -hmm. list will retire, which will save a person at the bottom list that's scheduled or tentatively scheduled to be retired. Okay. The, the, the number of people available to work, the number of boots on the ground is going to stay the same with the exception of the additional two. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Ms. Okay. Adrian. So, Kate, this was identified, this option was identified since last week because you believe you heard that direction from council. That's Although right. it wasn't verbalized in such a way, you believe you heard that direction. So, has the Enterprise Fund been involved um, in this discussion and um, what, is their, what is their take on it? Like because we have, we have, as we know, um, have heard for at least 12 years um, that there has been, in most of the building industries, evaluation, um, and much of it proven, um, that there were charges against that fund that never belonged there in the first place. I'd like to know how they feel about um, this allocation coming from their fund now. For the record, Kate Thomas, I'd like to address the first part of that being that we would never allocate a revenue recommendation that wasn't completely justifiable as far as a nexus between the work that's being done with the inspectors and the permit review um, and, the re and the revenue that one could argue should have been going to the fire department all along. So with that being said, I'll turn it over to Fred to talk about whether or not the communication or how the communication occurred with the Building Enterprise Fund. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Fred Turnier, Community Development Director. And uh, from the, the last uh, meeting, we did have some, uh, we understood some direction for, uh, from council to go look at uh, the, the different ways uh, the enterprise was funding for a fire service. And fire uh, provides a, a, an essential service to the building uh, process. They, they check for uh, the life safety issues, uh, such as sprinklers and uh, fire alarms. And uh, typically, the enterprise has paid for one FTE, full-time equivalent, uh, fully bundled about 120000 And uh, on the inspection side of the house, uh, that has been paid as uh, FIRE has uh, requested uh, inspections do occur for a project. So we met this week to look at that service because for our building industry, um, instead of paying for, uh, you know, some dollars here, some dollars there. We want to pay rather a lump sum for a service, a fire service, from plans examining to inspection. So we met this week and, and looked to see what that number uh, is. And uh, we, we came up with a number uh, based on um, just uh, the amount of inspections and plans examining that does occur. And so we, uh, we, we came up with a number, and uh, we actually had this on the agenda for the building enterprise uh, for May 12th. Uh, I did uh, talk to uh, our chair, uh, Curtis Rowe, uh, about this, but I told him that when it comes down to the details of what that service is, uh, we'll have that discussion on May 12th. And, and for us, our, our big issue is uh, the service delivery. Are we going to get the service delivery for what, what we're paying for? Are we going to continue getting 90 plus, plus uh, percent, uh, 10 day initial reviews, and are the inspections going to happen in a timely manner? So uh, for us, that, that's what we're looking at is having that service delivered uh, and for that price. That price needs to be justifiable uh, for us. Okay. Just to add on to Fred's comments, we did also discuss whether or not we would annually and, and believe that we should annually revisit and evaluate whether or not the service delivery matches up with the commitment that the Building Enterprise, Enterprise Fund has given towards this um, solution. And what's the timeline of when we would be able to make those types of evaluations? How soon would we be able to do that? 
Well, the fire department took information, um, I know they worked through the weekend to pull together the number of permits from our Acela system to, to determine what should that base number be based on the work that's been done year to date, current fiscal year. So that was one of the, this, the baseline numbers used to develop the number that would then come from building enterprise to offset the general fund numbers. So that analysis has been done for this current fiscal year to date. What my recommendation would be is that once the payment, and we haven't figured out how the, the fund transfer will actually occur yet. We'll do that, you know, post this meeting, should council decide to move forward. But we can go back, say, in a year and say, okay, we've got another fiscal year of data in front of us. Did, did it, was it enough? Was it too much? You know, how does it align with the service delivery that's being provided by the fire inspectors? And back to the question that's already been asked and answered a couple of times. I haven't heard an answer definitive for me yet. How will this 250 exactly equate to overtime savings? I mean, we heard the chief say that it's, I would use the word a nebulous thing, but clarify that for me, please. Mike Hernandez for the record. That will offset two individuals that I would have to recall on overtime should that vacancy occur, whether it's sick leave, a vacation, military leave, family, et cetera. Can I, ask, can I ask it in, a, in another way? You know, I want how, much, how much are you reducing your overtime budget by adding these two employees? We're not reducing. Well, uh, that's, we're not that's, reducing that's our overtime the budget. Well, I, I wait, wait, wait. I, I need to hear that answer again, Mr. Muir. We I, are I, not reducing our overtime budget. Our budget this year, our overtime budget was is, this last fiscal year was the lowest it's ever been. And we are going to keep a fixed number of dollars, and I'm going to look at my financial analyst for the exact figure, but we're going to keep an exact number of dollars because there will be times when we have to open up stations based on threat and risk, as I've advised council, you know, uh, and that will have to be done. There's no other alternative. That will have to be done on overtime. The two positions, and, and let me be clear, the two positions are going to offset potential existing vacation vacancies and sick leave. A classic example is today. We had one person, I think, every station is open. We had zero vacation days taken today. Everything is open. There will be times when individuals will take vacation and we will be, a de we'll have a deficit in personnel to fill those stations and we will have those nine floaters. This gives us an additional two. So we will have additional personnel to offset those vacation days. So, you know, to, to try and specifically say this is going to save us $682.42, it's, it's just not a calculation we can accurately make because our staffing and our vacation rate usage varies from shift to shift to shift. And I, let me just say one thing. I do remember us instructing staff to see if they could find money to, to do in the fire department what we need to do. And we did do that. And that's true. That's exactly right. And I commend staff <coughs> for doing that. Thank you. It, oh. Mr. Mr. Mayor? And, and I, don't, I don't disagree. I do, I do remember that. It just seems to me, as we sit here today, we're taking from Peter to pay Paul with an unknown variable that doesn't improve safety. Mr. Mayor, if I may, I think we've had a lot of information from staff on this decision-making point. How about if we put this in a parking lot issue and, and return to it for a vote a little bit later you know, just kind of as we go along as a matter of process, take side issues and know that these are the ones that we want to return to and maybe um, take votes on. Because I, I think staff does want, you know, specific votes and direction. So if, if the others are comfortable, could, would you could, be ready we, to well, move on? We can park this on the side for a little while. But if we do that, Mr. Mayor, we need to make certain that staff has heard all of our questions so that they can resolve them when we come back for clear for. That if you have thing. more questions, let's ask them now. Yeah. I mean, really, what is that nexus between overtime and the inspections? So for the record, Kate Thomas, the, the nexus is between the revenue that's currently being generated around a fire-only function towards offsetting the inspection positions to free up the general fund. So that's how you get to the funding of the firefighter. It's not taking enterprise dollars to fund firefighters. What you're doing is aligning the, the enterprise dollars with the enterprise function, which then relieves the general fund of that liability, freeing up that revenue to be dedicated towards retaining two additional firefighters. Mr. Mayor and Council, too, if I might just clarify, too, this, this is not 
the, the exercise of, of looking at you know, the function that the fire inspectors perform and looking at the fees is not something that the fire department set out to, to look at after the last meeting. They were already in the process of looking at this, and they had already had some preliminary conversations with, with us about it. Uh, we just accelerated those conversations because if, if there was a potential there, and I wanted to know if there was a potential there, then we knew it would help relieve the general fund, which potentially could then offset other expenditures of the general fund. So I, I want to be clear that the inspection services and the plans re review services were being performed already and were just funded through the general fund. This now just puts that responsibility in the building enterprise where those fees are being paid. Any other questions right now before we table this one for a while? Okay, let's go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We will now jump into the follow-up items from the last budget workshop. It was requested that we break out the benefits section of the general fund expenditure slide. You'll recognize this from last time. Uh, Councilwoman Breckis had asked, what percentage of the benefits um, our current employees versus retirees, and I'm sorry if I wasn't clear last time, but the, the benefits section that you see up there, that 25% is the current employee base. The retirees are paid out of the, the fund transfer debt service area up there, which we've kind of se sectioned off into two pieces and pulled out that little black sliver. That's the PAYGO or the other post-employment benefits, which is how we fund our retiree health, health costs. Uh, and the benefits, and that's in that pay-go um, for OPEB. I'll show you that a little bit differently. Um, I know you've heard me drone on and on about OPEB and that liability that we have. This is if we were to move forward and fund the annual required contribution. You see how that slice jumps up to 10% and kind of, you know, that that is us making the, if we had an extra $11 million, making the commitment that we start to fund that liability down um, as opposed to, um, at the bottom, you'll see of this slide here, the current methodology that we use, which is that initial sliver, which is at $4.3 million, which is the pay-go, and then the normal cost, which would stop the liability from growing, we would need an additional $4.42 million, and then the ARC, which I alluded to in the previous slide, is an additional $13.8 million, uh, bringing us up to funding that required contribution at $18 million. So just so you sort of get a scope for when we talked about um, retiree benefits. We also discussed last time, and Council had asked us to bring back some more information around the core services review around fleet in particular. I know Council Member Dorch had brought that up. This is one of those activities that was in process, um, and we wanted to bring forward information for you on, on looking internally at some of our larger functions to determine, and this includes fleet once more, um, where we could have improvements in staffing, data-driven service delivery, um, whether the budget allocations to parks and rec and public works are, are correct indeed, and to do that our recommendation was to take an outside or an external person to come in and do that analysis, somebody who does this uh, over and over rather than having someone internal who might be slightly jaded or not. Um, looking at the fees, the fee schedule that we currently have, our strategic plan, and then making those recommendations around two of our lar larger service-driven organizations, which is Parks and Rec and Public Works. Additionally, you would ask for information on the parking garage. The 160 that we mentioned in the last budget workshop is again for structural repairs on floors two and three. Um, you can see additional information there. And then the council had questions on, hey, what is the whole package that's necessary to address the parking structure if we go down, down the path of acquiring that asset? Um, the total that we came up with here, and you'll see the numbers are very round. It's, a, it's an initial snapshot of what might be necessary, but it's almost a million dollars to control access to the garage, which would allow us to have an entry exit system potentially charge for parking with validation, um, painting the interior, which as you are well aware, desperately needs it, um, doing some more significant slab repairs to some of the other surfaces, and then of course the elevator would, would need to be replaced, and you see the half million dollars identified there. With, the, with, with this, and, and where is the Cal Neva on this? Are they ponying up or doing anything? Because it is their garage, we don't own it yet. Right, and we are in discussions with the Cal Neva. I'm going to bring up Bill Thomas, who's been in those discussions, to give you more information. <clears throat> Council, Mayor, um, for the record, Bill Thomas, Assistant City Manager. The agreement that the city has with Cal Neva is that they would maintain the facility, um, but there's no, we pay no rent to them, we have no leverage, we've had conversations with them, and the short of it is the maintenance level at which they're providing right now is the maintenance level that they intend to provide into the future. 
Um, so that's what started our conversations with them in terms of um, how do we change the dynamic of the situation now. And uh, unfortunately, we have not finished those negotiations yet to bring forward to you uh, the resolution of really doing some of the things we think need to be done to the parking garage. This, the way we see it, is putting the money in the budget now um, allows us to have the money should the council choose to move forward with an agreement with Calneva. If, in fact, um, you choose not to, then obviously we'll have to revisit this money. But um, we know there are things that need to be done to the garage. We know that Calneva said they're not interested in doing those things. Um, we also know that we have to have that garage in order for our facility to really operate the way it does. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Yes. Um, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, as you can see, if we come in with this 160, we're in for a long haul because there's other dollars flowing out years. And I've, um, I'm not averse to it. I would like the council, though, to give direction on what sort of, you know, kind of mull this over a little bit more. And so to that end, rather than park this $160,000 right now in the Public Works Department budget, I wouldn't mind putting it into contingency, just letting it hang. It's kind of a budget, you know, where it's placed until the time that we have a little more robust discussion and get a um, kind of an agreement, uh, you know, deal points from the Calneva. I think it's just... Um, an interim step, and that, that's what I would suggest. Well, and I think if, uh, before we go improving their property, uh, we need to take over ownership if we're going to start. And so they ought to sell it to us for a dollar, and we go from there. And we do have a offer to sell it to us from Calneva. We were just waiting until we got the deal points to a point where we could bring it back to the council and have you decide if, in fact, that was the the agreement that you were that was acceptable to you so um, again we're bringing that forward uh, my I guess Kate can answer it but I think whether or not it's in this public works or anywhere else it's not so important as the fact that we have the money there if you choose to move forward with this agreement yes Mr. Delgado I'll go ahead Neil sorry um, Mr. Thanks. Jordan when when you talk about the structural repairs um, is there a way in which you evaluate its structural viability like like a bridge i mean are we are we in jeopardy of the thing falling down or causing well, uh, i can let mr flansburg address that but i we did have a study prepared um, and there was a recommendation in terms of how much should be spent to bring the building up to probably where it should be uh, that number was significant so what this really represents is, I think best explained, is how do you stop the degradation or slow it down? I don't think anything that we've seen says the building's gonna fall down. It's just like most things. If you don't maintain them properly, they fall apart quicker. And so this would be a plan where we don't move to the highest level, which is bring it back to maybe where it would be if, as if it were brand new, but to actually keep it from getting worse. If, uh, Bill, if we purchase the garage, and we'd be up to getting it up to code, correct? Uh, at that point, once we purchase it. And so that's where you're talking about the whole million uh, that would have gone into place in the whole entire thing. So we'd have to be ready to, once we purchase it, to pony up the million dollars to get it up to code and ready? Or are we set to have to do that now that County Eva owns it? Do you see where I'm going? If the County Eva owns it and we were able to use it, then we could do this step-by-step -step increment because it's not a public facility. We don't have to have it up to code. Does, does that make sense? Right. The, I think the main thing in terms of code, because we should be clear about it, it's not an unsafe building. If it was unsafe, none of us would be in there. It's just that there are certain things, for example, you can see on here painting the garage interior. That may not be a code issue, but it's an aesthetic issue, and um, all of you, all of our public, everybody comes into that garage, and we just feel, you know, it should have the proper appearance for a municipal parking garage. But that's something that the council could choose to say, no, it's acceptable as it is. Um, there are some minor things, I think, primarily related to um, Americans with Disability Act that would have to be done w when it changes hands. Um, but again, for example, the, the elevators. The elevators are probably safe by code, but those of you who've ridden in them know they're probably not to the standard that anybody would want to have their elevators at. They're not unsafe, but they're unpleasant. So the idea is we will bring back to you solutions to raise the level of uh, that facility and ultimately give you in our best judgment how to balance having a great facility with one that um, has been somewhat uh, in disrepair. Those are your words, Mayor, not mine. It's a disgrace. That's what it is. 
and people think that it's our parking garage and everything, and it, it is a disgrace. And we need to do these things, but I'm glad to know that you're looking at getting the ownership turned over to us. Then I don't mind spending those dollars. But let's go ahead and keep going now, and then we'll get back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The next four slides are regarding a question that was brought up last time in some discussion around the risk division, the responsibilities, um, sort of information that was asked to come back. The council, uh, we worked with the city attorney's office, and so I will turn this over to Tracy Chase to present the next four slides. Tracy Chase, Reno City Attorney's Office. To put this in perspective, the risk division was a component of a l much larger department that was moved to the city attorney's office. Originally, it was part of organizational effectiveness. It, organizational effectiveness, effectiveness had public information, it had website, it had workers comp, it had claims, it had safety, OSHA issues, and things like that. What the city attorney's office took over a number of years ago was a sliver of these responsibilities that we know today as the risk division. The risk division duties are we do claims and tort litigation. We do insurance coverage, obtaining insurance coverage for the city council to review every year. We do recoveries, for example, if there's a car accident and that car runs into some public improvements, such as a stop sign, we would seek to recover the cost of that damage. We do trainings in tort mitigation, and we do the budget administration and preparation for the risk division. We put up a slide of the last uh, number of fiscal years, what we have had in reserves for claims and the actual results and payouts. And you can see the, the work that the risk division, the, the, the men and women of the risk division, the, the attorney work, the paralegal work, the staff work, it, it goes, it's a significant amount of work to have a reserve set at like fiscal year 11, 12 of 723,000 and only have payouts of 135. You can see mid-year this year, we have high reserves, but our payouts and claims are down at only $62,000. The claims work in the risk division actually facilitated a review, review of the fund for the fiscal year 12-13, and $950,000 was returned in reserves to the general fund that this council utilized to balance the budget. Next slide. Now, part of what we do is our property vehicle insurance program. The property vehicle insurance program has had challenges, as this council knows, over, over the last few years. In the fiscal year 12-13, we were advised that our policy renewal would be with much less coverage with a 28 plus percent rate increase. So what our department did is we went to the market in coordination with Wells Fargo and we updated all our property and vehicle lists. We determined that a lot of our property and vehicle lists, we were under-reporting the values. So we increased those values, and we only had a limited rate increase of 3%. And the coverage was maintained at actual higher levels. And we increased the stop loss from 250000 to 300000 without an additional premium. That means we had 25000 more of coverage. In the fiscal year 13-14, again, insurance in the market has been going up over the years. We face challenges in our property vehicle insurance program and our excess insurance program. We had an anticipated increase in property and vehicle coverage of 30%, which was going to be $114,000, so it was significant. As part of the property coverage, we lost or we were facing a loss of our major earthquake coverage and to purchase that separately was over $250,000. So what our department did on behalf of the city is we went out to the market again and we secured all risk coverage at current or higher levels for less than a $40,000 increase, which was significant considering the amount of increased costs that we were facing. That year also on our excess um, insurance coverage, our carrier actually declined to insure the municipal market. So we went through an entire process of going out into the market again, and we, we obtained the excess loss coverage through PEPID that the city council approved last summer. 
The other miscellaneous um, work that the risk division does, I indicated recoveries, and I gave you a three-year snapshot of recoveries that we do. Now, this is dependent on what type of car accident hurts our infrastructure as a city or our property. But you can see that we're pretty steady on our recoveries, and we're actually going up 2013-14. Um, we must have had a higher recovery that year this year. In addition, on annual trainings, now we do not do the safety trainings for the city or you know, OSHA, things like that. What we do is trainings that mitigate tort liability. And that would be, every year we do civil liability training, civil rights training, constitutional law training, constitutionality of gang enforcement, and individual department consultations on claims and special events and any other um, issue that they are facing that would increase the tort liability to the city. In addition, that we put together as part of the city attorney's office a risk team that will respond on major incident responses. We were on the Renown incident, we were on the Reno Air Races incident, and we were on the Collin Fire incident. We, we covered those 24-7, so um, that has been an addition of uh, duties that our office felt was needed for to the city and we added that to the risk duties. If you have any questions on what the risk division is and what we do for the city, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I asked for this information and I appreciate the presentation and I also appreciate the good work that the city attorney's office has done in um, taking over when we had to cut our risk uh, efforts a bit. but. Um, I do have concern that risk is one of these areas that we're not as robust as we could and should be, and um, and just some things are going miss missing. Um, you know, for example, you mentioned in the training that a lot of the training is related to torts, but I think a more robust, encompassing risk approach is looking at training across the organization in per, in risk, and particularly in risk prevention, which I don't know that the city attorney's office is really the best place to house that. And I guess, you know, something struck to me at last meeting is that the city attorney's office presently has a vacancy for a civil deputy attorney. I think it's time to have the risk attorney who's been, you know, working kind of doing all risk to, to, if the city attorney decides to, you know, put that person into that, back to those functions, and move the risk manager position under the city uh, attorney's office, or the city manager. I think that's where it should reside. And I think it's one of these things we can do um, with no budget implications, but can save us money in the long run, being just more strategic. So I'd like to hear Mr. Manager's um, comments on, on that and my kind of overall concern about the risk management function. Yeah, the, the question is, is do we have a robust risk management function? Um, ideally, you would like to have a permanent full-time risk manager. Um, you know, not to say that the city attorney's office doesn't do a, a good job, because I think they do, but I mean, I, I don't disagree with you that there are other functions of a risk manager that if you had a full-time position doing that, particularly on the training and sort of the risk mitigation um, side of it, you know, there, there is benefits to that. Can I sit here today and, and quantify those benefits uh, for you? I cannot. But I will also say, I mean, the risk management function is like a lot of our departments as well. I mean, if you look at our, our purchasing function or internal audit, which we don't have, I mean, there are a lot of functions that are not robust. And where does this one fall from a level of priority related to, you know, say an internal auditor? Um, you know, I, I can't answer that question today. Um, so the short answer is, would I love to have a risk manager? Yes, I would if the resources were there to do it. Um, does it function well the way it is? Um, I mean, it, it functions well, I think. Well, I guess my other question is, uh, Mr. City Attorney, you have a vacancy right now for a civil deputy. Is that correct? Tracy Chase, Reno City Attorney's Office. Yes, we were holding that position until all the um, payouts were okay. completed. And so if the person who's the city, deputy city attorney who's been functioning as a risk manager is slotted into that spot, then that would free up some budgetary number for us to then hire a risk manager without being a, a zero impact to the budget. Is that, would that be correct, Ms. Budget Manager? 
For the record, Kate Thomas. Yeah, that is that is a call that the council and the city attorney's office can certainly make as far as leaving a position not filled or moving someone and leaving that vacant position to allocate funding elsewhere. That's certainly up to you. Yeah, and you know, I'll just I'll give an example. Yesterday, I was driving home um, by St. Mary's and I saw a city vehicle parked in a red zone. Um, you know, in that metered area, and that's the kind of training that I want. I think that we're missing is is you know, just some of the daily operations of the staff, and, and there's a whole areas, and I, I see a lot in the trip and falls. I know we used to be more robust in, in understanding and seeing where our risk on the trip and falls were that we pay out. So anyway, I do think um, that this would be something for consideration, and I'd like to call for, um, you know, hear from others perhaps on this. Mr. Well, Mayor, Tracy Chase, there is not just one position funded in our office from the risk. Um, there is a position like I do the insurance and that part of risk, so part of my salary is funded. Um, the attorney who does the litigation and claims his salary is funding, and we have an assistant. So by pulling out one funding of a deputy that's that's not there that we would have other assigned duties, there would be effect to our department because we would have less resources for what that attorney that we're hiring is supposed to um, do their work on. So you are just shifting uh, duties and you would be shifting funding, but there would be a loss of uh, city attorney office uh, services to the city as a result. So that attorney and you would still not be involved in risk? I mean, I would hope well, that you continue to do the level of support that you did previously for risk. Well, we're funded out of the risk fund. It's like enterprise fund versus general mm -hmm. fund. And so. I think the council could still make that call that, you know, they can commit budgetary risk money to the city attorney's office. It is a call of the council. I think I you know, made my case and I'll, I'll leave it at there. Let's go ahead and move on. Mr. Mayor. The Downtown Pride Program was one of the points of discussion last time. Council had asked us to bring back the specifics around that program. This, as you recall, was uh, the, the item that Ms. Brooks came to speak on with the partnership. We had some discussions with the police chief. These are the goals. I won't read them to you. Obviously, you can see and you're well aware of what the objectives were when we put together the team to look at this. And then these are the resources dedicated um, with that number. I will point out, um, math error last time we had seventy five thousand dollars allocated for high sierra industries the number's been eighty for quite some time so i was remiss in adding that extra five in there so that's why if you see a discrepancy between the one thirty eight and the one forty two um, that's where that number comes from. So as you can see, we talked about the staffing around having some individuals come and perform trash pickup, sidewalk sweeping, um, serve as ambassadors. That was that program that Ms. LaVon Brooks talked to you about at the last budget workshop. Um, we had $13,000 slated for non-traditional work hours so that these folks can go out and collaborate with businesses um, outside of regular work hours so we can target some of the other issues. And this is the CSAS team, which is the community services and safety team um, that's in existence now. This just allows them to have some more flexibility to target some issues that are not um, currently allowable based on the time that they work as well as two seasonal public work staff to, to target specifically graffiti removal, some of the power washing that we need downtown on occasion, um, and then $25,000 for specific capital improvements that you can see listed here. Room tax was an item that we had discussion on actually at the last council meeting, not the budget workshop, but the council meeting. I, I had uh, spoke to the fact that we would bring back a slide that depicts kind of the history of the room tax and, and the room tax fund. We had a very fun time trying to track down what the original authority was for this. Um, we located the ordinance. I have copies of that if, if anyone's um, interested. But this is essentially what I think Ms. Faye spoke of last time where we have a half percent for tourist related projects. Some of that goes towards Parks and Rec that you can see below is a consistent at $900,000. There was a question as to whether or not those resources were dedicated to specific projects. And back in the day, my understanding was that they were. Um, currently, though, it's, it's a revenue source that goes into the Parks and Rec budget right now, um, a pretty significant one at that. Let's say we were to discontinue this, we'd be looking at a loss of about a third of their staff. So uh, it's a very ne necessary portion of the Parks and Rec overall operational budget. Mr. Mayor, if I may, I, I asked for this to come forward. and. You know, room tax is a very complicated thing, and I, I know that those who have been sitting on the RCVA or have know a lot more about this than I do, because what comes to the city is just a small, small chunk of what goes out region-wide for room tax revenue. 
But um, at some point, it appears to me that a decision was made that a, a, a percentage would be earmarked by the city council to Parks and Rec. That 900,000 is, is what percentage of the Parks and Rec budget? Let's see here. Let's see here, hang on a second. I've got the Parks and Rec number. Do some quick math. Here we go. 9.6. So 9.6 million, yeah. Yes. So okay. I mean, that's, that's almost a, a tenth of their budget. A tenth of the park's budget comes from room tax. Um, and you can see where the rest goes. A lot goes to the special events and the arts. And I just, um, you know, we're struggling in parks tremendously. I know we've made commitments. We have a process for special events. But, um, you know, I think at some point it's where's the core responsibilities and beyond public safety and infrastructure, I think it is parks. I'm not making a suggestion today for a budget offset, but I think it's a long-term area to examine. Not only the room tax that comes into the city, but the regional room tax. Well, I think you start cutting out special events, these numbers will go down drastically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because those are large economic generators. Yes, so you have are. to really pay close attention to that too. And I understand that, but you know, I start to think sometimes about the tourism and, and where do you want to go? Do you want to go to a community where the parks are bare and not cleaned up and, and falling apart? I, when I travel, we go to a park. We may not be there for a special events. We go to cities because they're interesting places and places that have a, a real high quality of life. And I think that we're getting to the point where some of our quality of life for the daily life is, is eroding. And well, I think I'm, that does not um, portend well do, for the economy. You do away with special events and I guarantee you, your parks will really look ugly. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I know we've got an economic tool that's coming to us here fairly soon on some of the benefits um, of these economic <clears throat> or, or of these special events relative to local impacts on restaurants, bars, even the crawls and the secondhand clothing stores and the initial feedback we're getting is that the impacts locally to local businesses is significant. So that speaks to the quality of life, not only of those coming to visit, for, but for those who live here as well. So I, I'm not in favor. I think we, we have cut special events funding to, um, you know, it's only in-kind donations. They, they've been cut over the years drastically. And again, special events drive this community. Special events increased this last year by 30%. So um, I am not in favor at all of, of touching anything relative to special events. And I can appreciate that. And I'm not saying it's in this room tax portion slice, but it might be within the regional room tax portion slice. And um, What do you mean by the regional room tax slice? Money that the RCVA receives or yeah, money you, that we take out of you, the So the RCVA should fund our parks? Is or they should sp fund special events. They do fund some special events. And, and how come they're not funding any of these special events? I think they, they do. do. In addition. So right. special events is getting more than, than just this. Okay. I've just, I'm trying to, you know, also as this budget process, for those of us who are new, it's also a learning example, too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The next slide was a, a request to show the full-time employee count of the various programs within the Reno Police Department. I'm sorry, that's a little difficult for you to read on the overhead. If you have questions, we'd be happy to answer them. And then lastly, before we jump into the fee schedule overview, um, we had been asked to bring back some information regarding parking meter revenue. So what we've got here is a depiction over time of those revenues coming in. This includes the fines and the tickets associated with those. And I'll note that um, it looks like we saw for a slight decrease in our fiscal 15 budget. That's because we're conservative around the numbers that we're budgeting for that. And additionally, we had a program in fiscal 14 that warned folks that should you not choose to pay your ticket, uh, we may put a hold um, on your DMV registration abilities. So that's why we saw a little bit of a spike in revenue at that point. And obviously we, we keep track of the revenues as we go through the year and make adjustments accordingly. So the, so the 
720 is from um, parking meter money collection, or is it including fines? That is our um, revenue projection for fiscal 15, and that inc includes fines and tickets. Our, our, what we feel is going to come in as far as revenue around those items. Thank you. And again, it's a little conservative, but we like to err in that direction. Okay, with that, we will go over, if council so chooses, I know we've got a little bit of time before um, the potential break. We're gonna have Cindy Lemmer come up and talk to you about the fee schedule. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Lemmer. Good morning, Mayor, Council, City Manager. Cindy Lemmer, for the record, from the Office of Management and Budget. I wanted to go over just very quickly with you the proposed fee schedule. I know you have all had your copies and had a chance to look over them. In community development under planning and engineering, there are some fee alignment recommendations in there that you have um, all had a chance to review. There's a new fee in there, the Medical Marijuana Establishment Zoning Verification Letter Fee. Wanted to point that out since that was not in your original packet. And then last week, the council asked about a minor special use permit fee. And I wanted to let you know that that is scheduled to um, go into this Title 18 Annexation Land Development Code update in um, fiscal year 15. Under business license, as you all saw, the alcohol fees, the approved 5% increase was put in there to take effect July 2014, and that's per Council Resolution 7779, which was adopted a couple of years ago. Under finance, very minor fee increase on both the sewer lien and the duplicate lien fee, and that is a cost recovery for the city. Under Parks, Rec, and Community Services, they're offering a new service, adult wheelchair rugby tournaments. The ice rink fees and the golf fees have been removed from the schedule since the city will not be operating them this upcoming fiscal year. And they did increase um, some of their fees in the shelters at Idlewild Park in Miraloma and the special event area in Idlewild Park to more, um, more cost recovery again there and market rate. And then finally, throughout the section, there were several places where we changed how we can charge for um, copying excess excess copy charges uh, so that it's standard throughout the document, and that's according to a new NRS. Uh, municipal Court, you received a revision on theirs because they changed, they did not adjust any of their fees, but they made some other types of changes. I wanted to make sure that council saw that before you approved the fee schedule. And then of course, as always, the fee schedule gets reformatted as we make all these adjustments once a year. We did add a slide here on the planning and the engineering fee information where we are comparing Reno's fees against several other jurisdictions. If you have questions on that, Fred would be here to talk with you on that. I do have a few questions on that. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, wait for Mr. Turnier to step on up. I understand that there was quite a, few, quite a bit of work that was done on reevaluating the planning fees. Um, can you just give us a brief overview on how you guys got there, Fred? Sure, thank you. Uh, Fred Turnier, Community Development Director, uh, through the mayor. Uh, essentially, this was part of uh, what was brought up earlier about the, the Building and Enterprise Financial Advisory uh, Committee, uh, including uh, other, uh, other entities such as Chamber and the American uh, or the Associate General Contractors, helping us take a look at uh, overall all uh, the fees uh, related to uh, development. So uh, back in uh, um, October, or I'm sorry, back in March, about a year ago, uh, the City Council directed staff to go ahead and take a look at uh, the development process and specifically the fees. So uh, we looked at everything from uh, the building plan uh, or building uh, uh, permits to uh, Regional Transportation Commission, re Regional Road Impact Fees, um, to uh, the, the planning and engineering fees. And so basically, uh, the question we have heard a lot from people is why why is a master plan amendment twenty two thousand eight hundred and fifty four dollars and what justification do you have for that and uh, doing an analysis and and how do you compare to other surrounding jurisdictions so what we did was uh, we, we looked at how how these fees were established and originally these fees uh, planning and engineering fees were established through through an enterprise Planning and engineering used to be in an enterprise uh, fund. 
And so basically the 17 planners that were associated uh, with providing the service were part of an enterprise fund. And so how you get there is what, what's your expenses and then what do you need to charge to cover your expenses because we treat it more like a business. And so at that point, uh, we, we established the fees and uh, from uh, year to year, we would adjust as needed. Um, planning is no longer in an enterprise and, and we also looked at what other jurisdictions were, were charging. And uh, this chart describes uh, just different uh, uh, comparable jurisdictions. And uh, so then uh, we did an internal staff uh, analysis of how, how much time does it actually take to do some of these applications. And we came up with some standard uh, hours, uh, uh, which translate into standard fees. With the exception, this is always the caveat, is that uh, the discretionary process, especially use permits, master plan amendments, zone change, changes are always discretionary. So you may get a parcel map that should take 12 hours that may take 120 hours. Uh, I know we experienced something like that uh, uh, last year uh, with a parcel map up in, uh, in the north uh, part of town. And so uh, we always have exceptions, but we looked at what the standard uh, hours are uh, that it takes to actually deliver the service. And that's how we came up with the proposed fees. Um, Fred, so the, so the planning fees go towards the general fund. The general fund pays the planning department, correct? That's correct. And, and okay. the analogy I always use was it's, it's more like marble cake. It's not layered. It's just the general fund goes into the general fund and through this process with the council, is determine what it costs to, to provide services by the departments. So as you guys do conservatively, what's the hit that we're gonna to take to our general fund by taking a hit on our planning fees and decreasing our planning fees? Approximately 400,000. So we're gonna take 400,000 from our general fund to lower to decrease the planning fees. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, are we, uh, in our planning department, are we understaffed? Are we looking to possibly get new planners? Or our hope would be so? Uh, that, that's always the hope. Um, but uh, right now we uh, probably have, uh, uh, from a planning staff perspective, we, we could probably use some, uh, some more planners. Um, I could say we, we could use some more planners. Uh, when it comes to the development side of a house, uh, we are delivering uh, the services that are needed on the development side of the house. Um, again, if, if it costs uh, for an abandonment, $2,750 instead of $3,564, we should be charging $2,750 for that service uh, to be delivered. And that's how we're, we're viewing that. I, I, I see that there's some quite, there's a discrepancy, of course, with some of the charges that we have. But do you think that we're at a, an appropriate time that we can leverage 400000 from our general fund? Uh, knowing that some of our staff in our planning department specifically may be wearing two or three different hats. Um, and should we go as far as, as taking that much out? Again, the, the funds that come in go into the general fund and from the general fund it gets dispersed through all the general fund uh, departments. And so the, the money that's brought in through business license or brought in through uh, um, planning engineering goes into a bigger pot of the general fund sure. and through this process it's allocated towards resources so i don't really look as this is planning's money this is the general fund or the city's mm -hmm. uh, um, general so fund money potentially this could be money for parks it could be money for this fire is, it could be money for police it could be money for uh, anything that's uh, any considered under the general fund this yeah. would be money for okay. that and, and so we're uh, looking at taking four hundred thousand out of from from conservatively not from a good year or a bad year, but conservatively, that's what we're going to take a hit from our general fund to do this. That, that is being proposed to align the, the fees to, to the services being delivered. And again... Um, is, is the idea also that by doing this, that we're going to then create, we're going to get a return on, on our investment, that developers are going to come out and start building more? Is that the hope? And can you... Well, these fees, that gut feeling that these fees that? are just not for developers. And I know that, you know, in the paper it said developer fees. Uh, Picasso on wine, they're moving over to Vassar. They have to do a special use permit. They're not a developer. They're, they're in the wine and art business. And, uh, and people that are just maybe the mom and pops that, that get a special use permit trigger for their small business. A lot of these uh, fees do hit the, the business uh, uh, industry. So I do, oh, excuse me. Go I, I just, I look at some of these and it just, it's a little, you know, we're taking, we're, like, we're looking at a 
some of our, these, these are pretty big hits, right, for the uh, final subdivision map. We were charging currently $19,920. We're proposing 5000 So we're taking 14000 right off the top, right? Um, another one, we're going from our master plan amendment, which is basically 23000 to 6500 taking a $16,300 cut. Um, I could see where there could be some compromises in between there. Uh, or, or seeing what we can do from that point. It's just, it gets kind of tough for me to swallow some of the, the, the huge hits that we're going to take from our fees for. What, well, and, and to your point uh, on that chart, we have Reno existing, and then we have an average of those other jurisdictions that we compared ourselves to. And so the example uh, you brought up was that the master plan amendment is essentially $23,000. The average through these comparable cities is $6,300 and we're proposing $6,500. So uh, we're a little bit above average on some of these. Um, <laughs> we're, we're a little bit above average, uh, but when you go start looking at those fees compared to the average, uh, we, we do hover above uh, some of the, or we do hover above some of the averages. And some of these are completely there. deleted. Um, there's one, uh, the annexations, uh, basically through the Building Enterprise Financial Advisory Committee meetings. It was recommended that uh, we should look at having annexations at uh, zero dollars because a lot of times we are requesting people, mostly the single family residents that, with our, that are within our sphere of influence, we're requesting them to come into the city uh, because they have to get a building permit or because there's a, a land use application that they have to do. So at that point... I'm looking at four of them that are completely deleted. That are zero? That is zeroed out. Uh, there's one, the annexation per case. We you have, have annexation, you have the master plan amendment regional, you have the project of regional significance review, you have the trucking metal service area. Um, that's, that's four that I see here. And but, I mean, I'll, I'll open it up to the rest of the council. Yeah. I do have another question, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Actually, for either one of you. Um, and this question pretty much relates back to the um, earlier presentation on the two positions that could be funded out of the Enterprise Fund. It's, it's my understanding that in the um, um, plan review line item right now, we already charge for fire inspection in plan review. A pretty hefty amount, maybe like 25%. Is that correct? Uh, is that reflected in here? Through, through the mayor, Fred Trenier, Community Development Director. And uh, these fees are just for the planning and engineering fees. The inspector, the fire inspection fees would be on the building uh, side of the house, which, which we don't have up on the, on the board uh, right now. And, but you are correct. There is a spot for fire to check off. Um, it may be a $300 uh, price for a fire inspector for a tenant improvement on a 2,000 square foot new retail facility. So that expense is already identified and, and charged in the site review plans. Uh, for for, for fire this inspection, I understand yeah. that it's not here, but the it's not, okay, mm -hmm. it, it's not in here, but but it's already uh, bundled within uh, the building permit uh, application, and then fire goes in and they check off whether an inspection is needed and how many hours that they took or how many hours would be charged to the enterprise for those inspections. And is it about twenty five percent? You said you think it's about three hundred. What is what is that ratio? Uh, just an example I heard was a $300 uh, charge to for building that fire only charged $63 for. So um, that is, uh, that's about 25%, 20%. So staff needs to consider that when they're coming back with discussion points and answers to our prior discussion. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Did we ever look at it, all these fees and stuff? Did we come out with a way that a developer could pay so much it when he draws a permit and so Deferral. much as he goes along so that there's a pay thing instead of him coming up with three or four million dollars up front and he didn't get any occupancy for another year and a half? Is there? That is, uh, and I don't want to give away too much uh, that's coming before you in the future, in a future city council meeting, but yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, that was part of the recommendations that came out were deferral of fees from uh, building uh, permit issuance to certificate of occupancy because that could be six months to 18 months uh, window there. Um, we, the city still has a hook. We, oh, yeah. We, 
uh, because you won't get your certificate of occupancy until you, you pay your fees. That's right. And so we're looking at uh, the water fees, the, the regional road fees, uh, the sewer fees, the, uh, the parks fees. Uh, again, we, we want to look at the fees that you don't need the service immediately, right. that it goes into a capital improvement program and will be developed two to three years after that fact. Okay. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Um, and I, I appreciate all the work that has gone into this. Obviously, there's been many meetings and significant progress made on this. Um, you know, small business is the backbone of any solid community. And I did hear um, over the last few years some of the deterrence of some of the small businesses um, already concerned about investing dollars to open a small business because of some of these upfront very large fees. So um, I'm hoping that the offset uh, of increase in small business will offset some of these fees, um, the reduction in these fees. But my question is, you talked about uh, sometimes hours spent on a particular item can be 10 hours, and on another one it can be 120. Do we have a formula relative to an up to, and if it goes beyond, there's an hour amount tick? So that some that take are more complex than take 120 hours, there's you know, maybe an hourly amount build on top of it? When uh, Fred Turnier, Community Devel Development Director, when it comes to discretionary review, something like maybe a parcel map that may, be, may take 12 hours, which there's no development being proposed, it's just a, a line within, within a parcel, um, may be controversial. And so it's kind of hard to quantify the, the controversy because what you assume to be pretty straightforward may, may be bigger than than anyone anticipated. And that's part of the, the discretionary review process is so that we can vet with the public you know, what, what the issues are. We tried in the past doing a retainer-based uh, system where a developer would pay $5,000 and then we would charge a time and material after that. And the problem we ran into is that the more controversial projects uh, that came up were sometimes the ones that staff couldn't recommend approval for. And so a, a developer or business owner would, get, would pay the $5,000 because of where it's located in the community input, it would be another $5,000 on top of that. And then the, the business owner or developer would come up saying, okay, I've paid $10,000 and now I got a recommendation for denial. And I kind of called that the, 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 the staff hating fee just because we got calls, a lot of calls where people said, you know, you recommended denial, I'm pulling my application and I'm not paying. And so then we turned, got into this collection uh, type of uh, system, which, which just from an administration standpoint, um, again, this goes into the general fund. Um, just from an administration standpoint, it was a little difficult to, to do a, a retainer-based system. No, I, I, and I appreciate that explanation. I was just trying to see how we might be able to capture some revenue from those really extensive ones, but I do understand that that could be a a difficult thing to assess at the outset. Um, it, the only other concern, the, the complaint that we heard a lot too was not only are these upfront fees significant and, and I don't think we have ever quantified the deterrence that they have presented, but I, I also, am, the other complaint we heard regularly was how long the, the process took to get some of the plans reviewed and s get through the process. And my concern is, uh, uh, Oscars as well, is the staffing. Is this cut in revenue going to affect the staffing, which is in turn going to increase the length of time for some of these businesses to get through planning and development? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Fred Turner, Community Development Director. And uh, we're not looking at uh, staff increases, uh, additional new people, or, or staff decreases. Um, the time frame is, is uh, mandated through Nevada Revised Statute. Because it is a public process, there is a dais. We have planning commission tonight, and we have quite a bit of applications being heard tonight, which are publicly noticed. Uh, we have some people coming out, other people maybe not. Uh, but that, that is a public process, so we're, we're obligated to meet those statutory deadlines. Um, from a staff perspective, uh, you know, we, we have the same amount of staff. Uh, we're looking to uh, do some more cross-training with some of our staff. Uh, but uh, again, this money, we don't see this money as, as planning's money. This is the general fund money, just like the $18 million we raise in business license. That is the part of the general fund uh, monies. Mayor, yes. I may. Um, 
Well, I appreciate the concern of the impact of the general uh, fund, and I, I share that and, and want to look any way we can on efficiencies. I am thoroughly in support of this. I, as I mentioned, sat through the BFAC analysis meetings, and I have a just a real distinct memory in 2000 before the boom got going of a former community development director saying he was going to move the planning and engineering onto an enterprise fund. And I, I spoke out and said, don't do that. I remember people telling me about municipalities in California that did that in, I can't remember if it was the 70s or 80s, and when things went bust, it really caused problems. And what happened was, during the onset of the boom, these fees just kept going up and up and up, and everyone was moving so fast and, and paying them. And, and then um, they just got so out of whack, and they, I believe they are so out of whack. And, and one example I want to, that isn't captured in this table, is um, a lot of, because we haven't done a lot of frontward planning and updated our code, we run three people through a lot of processes that probably aren't necessary. And I've been using um, the Mayberry barber <laughs> across from Rayleigh's on Mayberry who's come through for a zoning change, a special use permit, and I still don't think he's through, as one who probably would not gone just a building permit if we had an ideal planning framework. And the BFAC fund does propose to work on that over the next couple of years. So uh, I think we'll get those efficiencies in there. But I know Henderson updated comprehensively their zoning ordinance in 2006 or so. Sparks is doing it now. I don't know when Fernley, you know, they've done code work. You were the city manager there. Um, I think Sacramento's always, you know, had a robust planning effort. So as clunky as our processes are, we've, we've had to, you, you know, see more volumes of these at, at exorbitant fees, and it, it really is an impediment um, to building the community that we need to build. So thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, Mr. Trenier, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate all the hard work that you've done on this. I really do, because whenever I first stepped into my seat, I remember this was one of our first issues, and, and I'm Thank you very much. Um, the other message I think we need to send is that we are open for business, okay? So I think this is a big message that we need to send so to encourage more people to develop. The other, the other issue, though, that I have with this, because I work with many, many small businesses, and um, the SUP, I really would like that to see um, in line with what we've done with the other fees. You only cut those that by 27%, and I truly feel that it should be by 50% because I am speaking to so many small businesses and it's been incredibly difficult. You saw what happened to Strega and these are, these are businesses that really are the, the big job creators. So I really want to pay attention to small business, not only um, big business, but small business. So I really would encourage council to pay close attention to that and then look at amateurs amortizing all these fees um, and then we talked about Reno Business Direct and I think that's the other issue is that we lose the communication with all these businesses that come here. I can't tell you how many times that people call me and say, well, I heard one thing and then I heard another. I heard one thing, I heard another. And I think we have to be on the same page when it comes down to directing these businesses, whether it's fees or the process. Um, and so I, and I understand that we're staff is a challenge, but I think that in the long run, um, we'll just be much more business friendly. But I really appreciate all the time that you've done because you know this has been a big concern of mine. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I just want to say that this has been a long time coming. We've been talking about this for a lot of years. I mean, I've been pounding the table saying that we've got to get our fees more in line so that we can be more competitive with other um, entities that are out there. And and I think this goes a long way to get us there, but I, I still don't think it goes far enough. Um, you know, but I think it's a, a step in the right direction. Um, and, and, and it really is that we've got to be competitive with, with our, the other, the other um, entities that are around us. And we're still not, even with the new proposed fees. Um, but, but it is a step in the right direction. I know that it's been a long time coming. Uh, I mean, I said years ago when we, when we were in an enterprise fund situation, and the, and the whole purpose, the, the way we got there was everyone was, was saying that development has to pay for itself. So that we've got to charge development for everything that, that, that they're, that's going into these processes. And 
my argument has always been that development should get credit to the general fund for all of the, the everything that they do. I mean, and if, and if you don't think that they don't benefit the general fund, take a look at the last five years. When development stops, our general fund took a huge hit because of it. So there's a lot of thing that go, a lot of good that goes in when you're seeing development out there that go into our general fund and our economy booms when development is going along, yeah. moving along. So um, it's a long time coming. Thank you, um, and I want to thank the Building Enterprise Fund um, for all the work they put into this. I mean, it's it's you guys have been working on this a long time. So yeah. and and I, I think it is a step in the right direction. And Mr. Mayor, I would absolutely agree. We've been waiting for this for a long time. Um, as long or longer than the TOD um, recovery that, that we put into place. I'm, uh, and, and again, appreciate as far as we've gotten, but there's still some, I, I believe there's still as much more that we can do. And I think that's evidenced by the numbers that we see from the southern part of the state. When you look at $500, $312, is, $550, is it? truly just because of the population, and if so, okay, then let's look at Henderson. We're pretty close to Henderson, um, and 37 versus 312, 312, not, thir not 3,700, is significant. Uh, help me understand that. And when we, uh, Fred Turner, Community Development Director, when we uh, took a look at the, these numbers, again, we, we compared it to, to what our process is. Across the state, the process is, is basically the same because it's all Nevada revised statute that we, we build off of. Um, and so it, it, and I'm speculating here, and, and just a little bit of a credential, I, I did work for uh, Clark County uh, in the planning department a long time ago. And so the, uh, sometimes the fees that were charged uh, did not cover the full amount uh, that it cost to, to actually spend on that. And, and that's really a policy decision of local entities whether, um, and, uh, whether they want to cover those costs of providing that service and have a minimum cost uh, associated with it or try to align it as close as possible with the service delivery. The model we have here and what we're proposing is to model it closely to the service uh, being delivered. Uh, I doubt you could do a special use permit for a $312 with staff, uh, but I think for Henderson, it probably was a policy decision on their behalf to, to not charge the, the full service amount, the expenditure amount. And just to follow up on that, I, I think, and we talked about this before, is I think we should eliminate a lot of our special use permits and take care of it through design standards. I know we've talked about this in the past, but I mean, you know, if, if we would revise our code and eliminate a lot of the special use permits and just take care of it through design standards, I mean, that's typically what happens is someone comes in for a special use permit, you condition it to get it to where you want it to be and, and it gets approved. Um, but if we could take care of that through design standards, you could eliminate a lot of the special use permits. Mm -hmm. And just an example that, uh, the 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. trigger for a special use permit. Uh, internally, we've been discussing how that may fit better in the business license realm. Because a lot of times people come up for business and they say, I want to be open from 4 p.m. to 12, uh, to midnight. And uh, then that triggers a special use permit. So you put your uh, business license on hold and then you go down the path of a special use permit. And we talked about internally, how can we uh, incorporate that into our business license process? Uh, to address some of those issues. I'm, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, Fred, I was just, so, for me, I, again, it's, it's concerning the 400000 we're going to take to, to the general fund, but I mean, I understand that uh, our hope is that the return on investment is that we're going to have new development, we're going to have new redevelopment, we're going to be able to do some of these things. My concern is too, and from what I'm hearing from you, is that we'll be okay in the planning department. They'll be able to you know, with some of these funds not being able to be allocated to your department to help you guys out, that uh, times and, and efficiencies are okay with that. I was trying to look out for from your from your guys' efficiency standpoint to say, hey, could this possibly go and helping out you guys get things moving a little bit quicker? But if you feel as though you guys are right on pace and things are going good, and I understand all the work that the the task force has done as well, then 
I really lean on, on your guys' feel as to we can take this forward and we'll still be able to provide the, the necessary uh, staff to the, the people in the community that want to build and, and get things going in Reno again. So, I mean, if that's what I'm hearing uh, from, from, your, from yourself and from the council, then uh, that alleviates a little bit of, of concern for me. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it at that and we'll see where the rest of the council plays on this. Yeah, and, and Mr. Mayor, I, I would agree. I, I'm supportive of the, the new uh, proposed fee structure, and I too am hopeful that the spur of small business uh, investment will offset the hit uh, that we may take, um, and I hope you're back here in a year asking for additional staff. Ms. Mr. Mayor, if I may, um, I'm, I am prepared that you know maybe we could move with a motion on the fee schedule and get that out of the way. But I, I do have concern about the skating, the ice skating fees being removed. Um, we have not come to terms with baseball. When that idea originally came up, and it never really came up in a kind of a formal way um, to the council, I always was under the impression that the city would be operating the rink and it'd be more of a lease agreement. And now I'm hearing that the ice, the baseball, will be operating the rink. And that's, I'm a little uncomfortable with that without us having a discussion with them. So it, it wouldn't do any harm, I think, to just put these fees in there. If we, at baseball, we do come to terms with them, we just don't charge them for the year and they come out next year. So I'd, I'd like to make a motion that we a, adopt the fees schedule as we have with ice skating in there. I would rather us do that later when we get down to it, because oh, we're getting okay. ready to go into redevelopment stuff. And, okay, and okay. We actually, we actually adopt the fee schedule with the budget, don't we? Oh, so. okay, okay. And I think that we're getting ready. Yes, sir. Well. Nope. You wanted some. Go ahead. No, no. No, no, go ahead. I heard, I saw you grab your mic. You wanted to, you wanted to everybody listen to him now. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, what I would propose is that once we've given all the presentations is that we go back and we take motions where there are decisions to be made individually on That's items. Okay, I'm okay. And also because we're getting ready to get into uh, the redevelopment agencies one and two, and there's going to be a lot of discussion. I'm going to propose it. Huh? There's going to be a lot of discussion, so I, I think that we should go into a recess till one o'clock and come back here. Okay, at one I'll I'll move my. Can uh, I before we do motion. that? I just want to add something. Yes. Concerning uh, Councilman Sheevy's request on the SUPs and that small business, can we talk look about possibly reducing that a little bit as we go forward on some of these other amendments? Well, we'll make a motion, I guess. We're okay, but just as you kind of look into it and see what we do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We can do that. Oh, yeah, and just uh, the council may, I'd like we to go into recess now until 1 o'clock, and then uh, I would like the council to come to the uh, caucus room just one minute before we go. We're in recess until 1. Why do you look so shy? Just because I called on you? Do you want, we have a couple public comments. You can. Uh, my name's Candace Pierce Bielser, and I do live in Reno. And the reason I came before you is because 15, 18 years ago, um, I was on the city council when we uh, voted on the ice rink. And I feel very strongly that the reasons we did the ice rink were were very involved. We took a long time coming to the conclusion to do it. We had casinos that wanted it. We had a big fight to get it for the citizens of Reno. And I just want to make sure that it continues in the form that it's in. I'm not here to advocate a location versus another location, but I was quite surprised to see that you're voting on taking away funding today in some form when you haven't even made the decision on if you're going to move it or keep it or what you're going to do with it. 
So I'd like to um, ask you to please not take, make any decision that's going to impact the future of the ice rink financially until it comes forward to the public. There are a lot of people involved in the ice rink. There are ice skating groups that were involved when we first formed it. There are all kinds of people that use it. It's a money maker, which makes no sense to me to all of a sudden give away something that's making money. But today, I just would like you to hold off making any decisions to impact its future so that when the time comes that, it, that you have a question before you of whether to move it to a certain place or not, or to keep it in a place, that you're not told, well, you can't do that because you've already taken the money away. So I would appreciate it if you would um, keep the funding in, uh, have some public hearings, make the public aware of what you're thinking of doing, and get some public input, because I do think that the ice rink is a quality of life issue in Reno. We put it on the river so that we could do photos and PR things with people ice skating on the river. It may sound minor, but right now, if you go to the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Chronicle or anywhere else, one of the photos they have of Reno is ice skating on the river. And we're not known as a community town. I think that this really shows that we have families that live here and that we have a wonderful environment. So that's the only reason I'm up here. And Appreciate it. Okay? Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Mr. Thomas, come up a minute, because my understanding, we're just relocating this for this season while they build the bridge or do something, but we're, we're not eliminating the ice rink, are we? For the record, Bill Thomas, Assistant City Manager, no. What we, um, what we know is that we're on course to uh, rebuild the Virginia Street Bridge, and as part of that construction, the skating rink would be displaced. So rather than shut down, which is a very successful community activity, for a period of years while the bridge is being built, we thought it would be prudent to go look for another place to put it temporarily. Um, so we have been discussing with um, baseball using that green space that they have in front of their building over a three year period to move it over there while the bridge is being built. Um, and so that's what we're gonna be presenting to you on the 14th is simply that concept. So it doesn't, the whole idea was to keep the activity downtown. And we found what we thought was a, um, a fairly fair and quick solution to what was going to be a complex problem, and which so is keeping the activity going. They're going to eat the expense and everything and rent the equipment and everything else right now. But in two, three years, it's back at this table for where we're going to locate it. Right. The, the, the agreement that's coming to you on the 14th will be a three-year agreement. So all it says is for a period of three years, um, it would be moved over there. After the fourth year, the council could decide to extend it, to move it somewhere else, to do whatever it chose. So again, the idea was to not lose the event. We were afraid that if we did not have a backup place, that because of the difficulty in finding a location and the expense, that we might lose the activity. So this is all about keeping the activity, but it's not a permanent solution. It's simply a placeholder. In fact, what will be happening on the baseball property will be temporary coolers right. and temporary facilities. Keyword temporary. That's correct. But Mr. Mayor, I mean, you know, it, it's more kind of process because it's coming forward in an agreement form, whereas, you know, the deal points or what we want operationally hasn't been before us. I went to the Parks Commission last night and Parks staff was telling the commission that the rink is going to have to be smaller in size than it presently is. And that's not something that we've discussed. And also, um, and I made this point, is when we went with the golf course to the Duncan operator, we were, um, you know, losing a lot of money and we, we sent it over to a golf operator. But we're doing uh, the ice skating rink, or at least staff's bringing an agreement, where they're the operator. And I thought we were always going to, the, the concept would be lease, basically lease the ground and run it ourselves. And so I just feel that there hasn't been enough discussion at this table on what this means for people from the public to come in and talk about what they would like. Mr. Mayor, if I might, this is, this is not an, <clears throat> an item on the, 
agenda today. I mean, it's really not a, no. a point of discussion um, for today. I mean, I think the decision, at least the discussion at the table, was to at least put the fees back into the fee schedule, and, and that, I mean, I think that's a smart decision. And I just, for, for the public's information, I mean, we will have a public hearing on the 14th at 2 p.m. to discuss this, and I think that would be the time um, for, for council to to hear the deal points and, and hear the discussion and hear from the community. And where we're going with the temporary set until Correct. we can get Correct. this back in order and bring it here or Wingfield or wherever. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Mark Markell, you had something you wish to say? You have two minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council members, and City Manager. My name is Mark Markell, and I'm a contributing resident. And I was wondering why you guys were talking about buying a parking garage when you're laying off firefighters. We're not. When I came in this morning, you were talking about redoing the the garage over Calneva and you're laying our firefighters. We have a lease with the parking garage and we will we're gonna do some repairs to it and we will try to take it over. We will not spend any money on the parking garage or buy the parking garage. I'm sorry, Mr. Misunderstood. I just think it's important. Public safety is important. I don't disagree. None of us do, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Hi, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. I'm Frank Avera in the Office of uh, Management and Budget. I spent a few moments today talking about uh, Reno redevelopment areas one and two. Do I have a clicker? Oh. Thank you. So each uh, uh, redevelopment agency budgets are set up much like a miniature city. They each have their own um, general fund and debt service funds, et cetera. The property values for re redevelopment agency one and two have risen over the last year, however, due to the large drop in values from the base, as well as devaluation of the casinos, we do not receive any um, ad valorem taxes for this year uh, nor next year. The tentative budget for 2014-15 for RDA number one includes total revenues of $737,124 and total expenditures of $870,300. RDA, RDA one includes the downtown areas, including the parking gallery, which we are happy to, um, <clears throat> to report as, as at full occupancy with the addition of the post office. The revenues for, the, for the RDA one include rent from the parking, parking gallery, the West Street Market and Motor Vehicle Privilege Tax. This slide shows the expenses from the property uh, for RDE one, which include property management, maintenance, and debt service. The 2014-15 tentative budget for RDE number two includes uh, zero revenues and total expenditures of $930,363. RDA2 expenditures include interest and principles on the Cabela's bond, as well as, as well as the settlement agreement with SK Baseball, which includes the fire station relocation loan. There was a transfer of $850,000 from the city's general fund into RDA2 to help pay for these expenses. Anybody have any questions? The fire station loan is $750,000 of the $850,000. And I don't expect you to answer this because I don't know that you haven't been here that long. But on the previous slide with the parking garage, when we did that real estate analysis of what were our assets, did we talk about repositioning the, um, I know we did some leases, but the parking garage, um, if you'd roll back that slide, are we, we're spending about $470,000 a year on our parking garage. It's a losing asset for us, or is it revenue? That's an expense, but I think there was some maintenance costs associated with that this year. Yeah. And those are exposed, 
those are proposed again this year, four hundred seventy thousand dollars. Why? Why are we losing that much money on that parking garage? I mean, our parking garage is like enterprises. Zach Hafner, for the record, um, the four hundred seventy thousand actually for fifteen is is actually going to be a net income related to the parking gallery because with the addition of the post office, we'll be at $500,000 in revenues related to $470,000 in expenses. So for the first time in that I'm aware of, we're actually turning a, a profit on that. Okay, $30,000 profit on yes, the part. When we had that real estate analysis, did we do any sort of pro forma on the parking garage? It just seems like... You know, especially now that we're talking about the other parking garage, you know, their businesses, how do we run these businesses is my question. Thank you for the record, Kate Thomas, Office of Management and Budget. I believe what you're referring to is the CBRE analysis of the city's assets, and I am not entirely sure whether or not that was included, but it would be prudent for us to revisit that given the changes in the economy since that study was done, so we can certainly take a look into that. Does anyone recall why we got bought that parking garage in the first place, and what what was the purpose for it? Pre previous, previous council built that the theater, loaned the money, built the parking garage, loaned the money for the theater and stuff. I think what do we get off of the theater every year? About three hundred thousand, or we were. Does anybody about three hundred thousand revenue off of the, and they paid back the majority of the loan. But that they, when they built the theater and stuff, now this is way before yeah. my time, uh, but they uh, built that parking garage and uh, that's over here, the new one. And mm -hmm. we lease out the land and stuff, but the post office is over there now. Oh, I guess one other question. We got this tolling agreement that, um, baseball has with their, um, uh, the DA. And it raises a lot of, a number of questions. Um, and I don't know if legals had a chance to look at that because what's the statutory authority for the district attorney to enter into a tolling agreement? I mean, can I, house owner Jenny, tell the assessor I'm not gonna pay, you know, let's just make a deal and, you know, we'll clear it up later. So I, I'd never seen anything. There's no statutory reference. I'm Tracy J. Serino, City Attorney's Office. The Washoe County District Attorney's Office represents the assessor. Um, so we can look into that, um, bring that back with you. We'll send it by memo up since that item isn't actually on the agenda, but we'll find out the response for you. The budget number of $850,000, this is the first year that general fund, not attributable, to the baseball, the fire station loan is presented. And I would like to know about this tolling agreement. And I'd also like to know the contract, and I took a look at this mid-year, I think. The baseball contract, don't they have to stay in good standing with all the regulatory requirements that they have? And one of those would be paying their taxes. And so if they are not paying their taxes, have they gone defective on our agreements with them? We'll take a look at that as well, that question, and we'll send a confidential memo to the council. Well, if, um, okay. I mean, if it is a confident, why would it be of a confidential nature? Tracy Chase, Reno City Attorney's Office, because that um, collections and the taxes, how it's going through the system, is subject to pending litigation. With us? In well, baseball? Not baseball yet, but between Washoe County and the city of Reno, I don't think that case is closed yet. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll look for that. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions on the RDA 1 or 2 for the good of the order? If not, we'll turn it over to Maureen McKissick from the City Manager's Office to talk about the Reno, Think Reno 2035 plan. Good afternoon, Council, Mr. Manager, Mr. Mayor. For the record, Maureen McKissick with the City Attorney's Office. I mean, <laughs> with the city manager's office. That has never happened before. <laughs> we welcome her in our office. Top of mind, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I'm here today to give you an update on an initiative you first heard about in February when you were at your strategic session 
Lisa Tutant, who was our consultant, gave you an overview of a strategic planning process and a proposed budget. Many things have changed since February and today, and we have reformulated how we are going to approach this, and I'm here today to fill you in on what that looks like. The last visioning that we did was in 2004. This was called Making It Great. Many of us remember Making It Great. Very much a city-led initiative, really the city manager, did not involve the community to any great extent. And then between 2004 and today, the slide shows the changes occurred both in our agency <coughs> and the community. The city changed three times. We reorganized three separate times. Personally, I had six bosses during that time. We lost about one third of our staff. Does anyone have a glass of water? Can I? Thank you. I think my stint in the city attorney's office dried me out. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> We can understand that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we've seen some serious economic shifts. The world prior to 2008 in Reno had a very different economic base than the one that we have today. And today's is actually somewhat more diverse. Demographically, we actually grew 12%. Inside of that growth, we have millennials. We have, thank you, Cadence. We have seniors, and we now have new opportunities that were not before us in 2004 or even 2008. We have the UAS project. We have a very robust startup community. So there are new opportunities even within our changed circumstances. When we went to the community, excuse me. Uh, in 2012, we tried to assess their take on what our community vision was. And the results of that were that we really didn't have consensus at that time. There was a great need for leadership. There was a desire to develop a vision. But they were looking toward leadership to do that. Where the city council has been, we have four new members. We are going to have three new members this November. We've had two strategic sessions both of which sought to find a new direction to take the city priorities. Within the community, we have new collaborations. <coughs> the Smarter Region, which I was very much a part of. The Rainforest Session, which looked at economic development, but also the culture which supported that. And right now, we have a new university master plan, which should develop a new plan by the beginning of 2015. So we are proposing a new process for visioning. This will not be the process you heard about in February. I'll go into it in a little more detail on the next slide. We believe that this is the right time for us to consult the community and create a new consensus around who we're going to be. When I was part of the Smarter Region visioning, <coughs> I'm sorry, it became evident when we spoke to different groups that there was a huge appetite for people's voice to be heard. They wanted a long-term, stable economic base. They priced a great premium on our quality of life. In fact, every group brought that forward. And they are looking for some vision that captures that. The path to defining that in this process will be very much community-driven. We see the community as the ones to help define that process. We'll be reviewing our city policies and how they support that vision. And we're going to incorporate the direction that you provided last February. Since that time, we have, in fact, fulfilled all three of these. The manager and his staff met with Sparks, Washoe County, Regional Planning, the RTC. We are not looking at anything collaboratively in terms of budget, but we will be collaborating on the work and we welcome that opportunity. So the plan that we've developed is called Think Reno 2035, and it is actually a bona fide comprehensive plan per NRS 278. We are going to go to the Planning Commission as the body which initiates that process and ask for their approval to initiate a new master plan. Our intent is to take the public participation component and expand it, broaden it, deepen it, capture much more than is directed by the ministerial process. So we've included a few examples. 
forums, stakeholder groups, roundtables, different kinds of surveys, workshops, really an opportunity for us to touch the community and them to provide input. We will have three deliverables. One will be the formulation of a new community vision. Out of that vision will come a new master plan. From the master plan, we will have the implementation tools, the development code and the CIP. Now, this graphic shows you an overview of that process. On the left side of the slide, the green inputs are where we're going to start. On the right side with the red will be the outcomes and the products of that process. We are not starting from square one. We have qualitative and quantitative inputs that we can analyze and assimilate into this process. Those will be the input on the community engagement, and there will be two direct outcomes, a new master plan and a new strategic plan. The strategic plan really becomes the action plan that drives into the city, how we align the departmental priorities with the community's focus. This provides a little more detail about the community engagement part. And we have a video right now which will demonstrate some of the work that OCC... I think Reno can improve on its freeway system. I think Reno can be the next tech hub. I think Reno can be a place for healthy, active, and engaged seniors. I think Reno can be a thriving, creative music scene. I think Reno can be the most innovative city in the West. I think Reno can be a great city for entrepreneurs and small business. I think Reno can be an affordable retirement community. <coughs> I hope that Reno will be the events capital of the world. I think Reno can be inspiring. You have all of these different areas and, and different individuals um, doing a variety of things. The question is, do they work together? You want them, if, the, if possible, to cooperate, and the best of all worlds is when they collaborate. That's much more likely to happen if you have a vision for the city. In any city, you have many different interests and many different people who have different needs. Community input is vital to the development and redevelopment of our city. I think it's important that the city of Reno have public workshops with the citizens to make sure that their ideas are what the citizens truly want to have. The city's budget is one big pot of money. That pot of money is derived from taxpayer dollars, so it couldn't be more important for citizens to have their feedback considered when putting together the city's budget. You never know where a great idea is going to come from, so the more people that you involve, the better your ideas will be. Reaching our citizens during our planning process is absolutely essential if we're going to get their buy-in because without their buy-in we can plan all we want but we won't be able to implement so please please let's make sure that we get everyone's voice heard that we possibly can an effective plan will allow us to set clear expectations for staff track performance and be accountable to our community we need a strategic plan it's the only way we know we're going to be successful is if we have a vision for where we're going So just to put that in perspective, I'm gonna go back to this slide. In the green box under community inputs, we see the Think Reno Ideal Portal, which will be part of what influences how we approach the community visioning. So a very important part of that input. Oops, I'm sorry. So the tactical execution of this, um, unlike what you heard in February, this is going to be primarily internally staffed. We are looking to staff in the Community Development Department and the City Manager's Office. Other departments will help as well. We foresee that we're going to need consultants, and those will be determined as we move forward. The time frame is actually two plus years. If we kick off after this July 1st, we would like to bring it back for approval while we have the council that will be in panel during the process available to make that approval. So before the general election in November of 2016, the proposed budget request just for this coming fiscal year is $150,000.
And we foresee as we move through the process, there will be subsequent budget requests, especially in, in FY15-16. We may be really getting into some consultant work at that point. 16-17 may be the production of the plan itself, the printing, the maps, some of the elements that are expensive. We've consulted with some other jurisdictions. We've studied some of the consultant programs that we used in the past. We believe that 150,000 will be adequate for this first coming year. And so that's the nature of what we're requesting today. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions right now? Yes, ma'am. Um, you know I'm a big fan. I, I love what you do, and you always have this great vision, and it's, and it's really, it, it, it's so admirable. I really do. I love what you do. However, in some of those slides, why isn't the Biggest Little City campaign um, part of this? That's one thing I noticed with the smarter regions. They're, and I think that they've been a huge player. I believe they will be a huge player in the community input. We are going to go into this process in a very open-minded, open-handed way. We don't want to presuppose what we know the outcomes will be, which is why we're taking all the inputs, assimilating those, and are then going to bring them forward. Not to test them, but to really prove them up and to see how they all mix together. The master plan itself, it's been 20 years since we did one. And the one that we're doing now has a horizon of 20 years, which is why it's called Reno 2035. So we really need to take our time and make sure that we are capturing the entire community in the process. But I see many of those initiatives playing a major role. Mm -hmm. I believe it's important for them to do that. Now the 150,000, is, is, is some of that allocated for consultants? Is that what you said? It could be allocated for consultants. We are going to be taking a very conservative approach to the use of those dollars. I see many of them being used for community engagement consultants to be determined. Yeah. As we approach this slowly and can build it very carefully, we may find the need to do that, but that will be determined as we move. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just get really weary when we mention consultants at the city. <laughs> Typically, master plans do use consultants mm -hmm. yep. because they have great expertise in certain areas and they can bring in best practices. And so, if they're used adroitly, they can really add to the process. Oh, no, and I agree. I just think sometimes um, we get taken advantage of, so I just want to be very conservative. We will be using, a, we will be using a public process to determine any of those so that council will have the assurance that the dollars are being spent wisely. Regardless of, of the dollar amount, we think that's important to make it as transparent as possible. And, and one of the differences in, you know, after we've gone back and, and retooled this, I mean, what we presented to you in February was, you know, the thought at that point in time was we would not be using staff internally to manage the process. So we were actually going to have a consultant help us manage the process. And so really the consultants that we're talking about now are experts in, in their respective areas that we'll bring in and we'll actually manage the project in-house. Right. I just want to be very careful. I mean, when we do surveys and things like this that cost us a lot of money, I mean, we got to go back to looking at wait, those costs. We will it's look at every for me. nickel and <laughs> okay. dime. I know, me. I know. Okay. All right. We will be providing constant updates both to the Planning Commission and to the Council as this process goes forward. The last time we did this in 1994 through 96, I think staff was in front of the council probably at least every other month providing updates on the process. So we foresee keeping you fully posted. By the way, great video. I love that, love seeing everyone's faces in there. I think OCC, it, I think you it did a resonates great job. is what I, I think it really resonates. Good job. Well, it will be one of the products we use to engage the public. There will be others depending on how we proceed with this, but we wanted you to see an example of the work. Um, and Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, I'm excited as can be that we are finally, and I'll emphasize finally, at this point, because Andrew, as you'll remember from our very first conversation in this council, certainly remembers this is something that I've been advocating for for a long time, um, and we're just so long overdue for, for having it. Um, so I absolutely support it. I understand um, the need for us to go back and redesign another plan on how to get there mm -hmm. uh, because we can't afford the traditional, more effective way actually, uh, by having 
qualified, bona fide, experienced consultants do this for us, that is the very best approach, but we can't afford it. Um, so coming back to our alternate plan, I have some hesitations um, only because of how we've utilized or not utilized some of our resources before, um, and specifically as it relates to our volunteers. I mean, we let go, how many people did we have on our NABs? Nine, 72 people um, that were tremendous volunteers. Um, and we still haven't um, come up with a formula to best engage volunteers for our high priority of public outreach. And here we are again looking at using many of those same kinds of tools and internal resources to now achieve this big um, product for us. And I, I just have some concerns. We haven't gotten it right on the volunteer side and the community outreach side. I just have some volunteers how we're going to do it differently, if you can give me some assurances there. Actually, what you have before you today is primarily a budget request and is related to that. The entire plan and the strategy we take and the approach we use and the specifics about the outreach and how we target different groups who in the past have been very supportive, that will come at a later date as we begin to formulate that. Um, we don't have all the answers on how we're going to do this. I have good information on how we approached it before. I have good information on how other cities approach it. So we have some choices we can make within that. Neighborhood groups, advisory councils, even homeowners associations have been tapped for that. We foresee many community forums, especially during the first year that we run this, but exactly how we devise those, where we hold them, and who is included, we haven't fleshed that out yet. And that's exactly the point that I'm, I'm reaching to is we're doing that right now and mm -hmm. none of them have worked for replacing our, our um, public engagement piece that our NABs used to be for us. So we're into it, whatever, about a year um, and it hasn't worked yet. Mm -hmm. That concerns me. Um, I understand that you need more time to design it. I just want you to hear that we don't have a history yet of having performed against the task that we put in front of us. How are we going to do it this time? And we foresee coming back to you either in late June or early July with a much more developed plan of approach for your input, for your approval, for your discussion. We would welcome that discussion as we begin to formulate the last stages of how we launch. So I foresee having a robust opportunity at that point to give us input on what you'd like to see. Ms. Jordan. Um, I, I think this is a worthwhile effort. I, too, have some concerns relative to how effective, particularly at the outset, with a, a budget that we looked at back in February that was about the $800,000 mark and now, for good reason, has been scaled tremendously back to this amount. Um, and, and going through these community forums, the message that I kind of consistently heard was that a lot of people didn't know about them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I kind of share in, in Councilwoman Zadra's concern that what kind of funding, what is this 150 doing to get the message out about collecting information from our community? Because uh, what's the avenues by which we're going to do that? We are going to be probably using some technology avenues. We are talking with one or two of the startups that have um, software that enables you to conduct that kind of in and out communication. I imagine we will be doing a community preference survey, which many people are familiar with, and, and that's a very formulated approach, a very statistically formulated approach to gather information. We foresee many different layers. We're gonna use targeted, facilitated small groups, as we did with Smarter Region. We'll be doing larger community forums, walk shops, for instance, which will be in place in neighborhoods. So a variety of different approaches, not just one. Ms. Brackett. Well, you know, I, I mean, we had to scale back, and that has been unfortunate. But I have confidence in the way that staff is outlining this and that it is important need for us. And Council Member Zadra, I see it differently. I spent many Monday nights from August to February with really neighborhood-based people tackling the graffiti issue, which is complex, and coming up with a very good formula 
that's multi-prong. You know, some involves resources. So, um, it was very engaging. Um, and we have a product that we can be, have as a template for 10 years to deal with graffiti. Likewise, I sat with, and it was members of the business community, many downtown property owners, as liaison to the downtown police maintenance assessment district, which resulted in a recommendation to us where we expanded that district and, and kind of solved a problem. I'm looking forward to the homeless task force that the city manager will be convening and that we've all suggested names for. So I think um, our outreach program over the last year and a half has been more robust and more um, targeted and out outcome oriented. Whereas the NABs I felt for many years were not going towards a, a discrete outcome. And I think the master plan if, is probably the, the best example of how you take citizen participation in a broad scale. Someone doesn't want to participate in economic development, they can be on a task force or go to community forums about public health. So I think it'll, it really is in the right direction and I think at the end of it, when done well, it can be not only policy for us, it can be a great branding document. Um, and I, I want to thank staff also for the exa fine examples they brought and gave to us about four months ago of all the, these great plans. So I'm, I'm really excited and I think, um, you know, I'm fully in support of this item. Okay. And the point I was making is we had 88 or 72, again, I just forget if we had nine members or 11 members, um, but we had 88 volunteers that we just let slip through the cracks. Um, without even an official thank you um, or a way to keep them engaged. And the master plan is exactly Actually, what they the lived and breathed every meeting. Um, and we didn't, we didn't utilize 88 people properly. Right. No. Can we not incorporate them in this process? Actually, uh, typically when you do a master planning process, and the term that's been batted around, which is interesting, is emeriti, <laughs> you look at previous board members of NABs, previous council members, previous members of the Planning Commission, you cast a very broad net to get the historic perspective and to honor that commitment. The time that they gave to us and the input they provided is, is really and then incorporated into something that's forward looking. So that would have been part of what we did, reaching out to them, convening them a last time and asking them for their input and what they would like to see going forward and then including them in that process. So it will be elected officials as well as volunteers. Okay, we have one public comment card, uh, Donna Klontz. Donna Klontz, um, citizen of Reno. I just happened to be in the audience and see that this issue was gonna be coming up. I had. I had no idea that it would be there. I've lived in, here in the city of Reno f since 1999. Um, I, I, before I got here, I was a practicing attorney, but I was also a strategic planner, and I did a lot of community engagement kinds of things with trying to deal with issues that the community in Ventura County, where I came from, had. And I've seen some of those same kinds of techniques used here in Reno since I've lived here. Um, I've gotten involved and a lot of others have gotten involved. I'm one of those ex-NAB members. I was chair of the Northwest NAB when they were dissolved. I have spent time volunteering with the city of Reno as a volunteer on the golf course for seven years and now I'm involved with senior activities. And the wealth of experienced professional people that are here in our city um, can be engaged if, if asked to help with this process, I think. Uh, I'm, I am a person who, I went through the Citizens Academy both for the um, City Citizens Institute and the Police Institute when they were doing those things. So there are, there are alumna of all of these connected citizens who have learned a lot of information about how the city of Reno operates. They've met leaders of the finance department and city manager's office and city attorney's office and council members and so on. They have not, I don't think, been engaged yet in the process that we're in right now with the end of the NABs and the beginning of this new development. And I would urge you to involve 
the ex-NAV folk, the, the names of the folks that, that you just heard that were former uh, members of the, of the city's staff who were planning commission and, and city council members, the, the graduates of the institutes, the volunteers that serve today and served in the past, people who gave many hours of their time, who know intricate workings of, say, the recreation department or the li well, that's the county library, but the operations of the government. We have, we have so many people who care about making this place a great place, and we seriously have been left out of the communication piece. I've shown up at the current things, and, and it's true. The, the number of folks that shown up have, were about the same size as the, the neighborhood advisory board meetings as well. So something's not working, but I think it's gonna take a special outreach to those five or 600 people or more who are still here in Reno who really care about what happens in the future. And they'd like to be asked, I think, and they'd like to be involved in what you do. And I'm real curious about what the $150,000 is going for too, so I'd wanna hear more detail about that one as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, just, just one last comment. I will, I will say that the, the NABs were poorly attended, certainly the ones that I participated in and, and sat through. Um, and the community forums have been, you know, not a, t yeah, yeah, not a, not a ton better. I have found far more success in finding where groups are already gathering and coming to them, mm -hmm. whether it be a rotary, an HOA, a school group, a church group, or the community out in Somerset with the, um, you know, the Del Webb community. Uh, and they seem to appreciate when we come to them. So just keeping that in mind that maybe, maybe that's the strategy on this that we should that absolutely is the strategy. That was the strategy we finally took with Smarter Region, where we took it on the road and went to where people were meeting and more or less crashed board meetings, asked for special meetings late in the afternoon and included beverages. It, it took quite a bit of ingenuity to get people to open up in an environment where they felt safe. So that will be an important component as well. Yeah, let's go to where they are. Is there any other direction at this any time? Any other council, any other directions you want to give? Thank you very much. Okay, I'm not sure. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, mem members of the council. If you will indulge us, we'd like to go back to the very beginning um, of the presentation and talk about item F2 on your agenda. And if that uh, works. What we'd like to do is after the discussion or potential direction around that, we can go over all of the items that were discussed today so that council can take action. Okay, mm -hmm. yep. that I'll bring up Mr. Chisel. Uh, good afternoon, Robert Chisel, Director of Finance and Administration for Legal the Record. Just a minute, oh. sir. Legal counsel, do you want to read the resolution first and then we'll. Be happy to. It's resolution number 7970, resolution of the City Council of the City of Reno authorizing the city manager or his designee to establish a 2014 limited voluntary early retirement resignation program for public safety employees in the Reno Fire Department and authorizing the city manager to take all necessary and appropriate actions to implement this resolution. Okay. Okay. Discussion. Go ahead, sir. All right, in an effort to limit the number of reductions in force in the fire department, uh, we are seeking to approval for a voluntary early retirement resignation program. Uh, the program will be limited to the fire department and will be limited to those who have more than 15 years of service. Uh, the offer will be a one-time payment of $20,000 to retire or resign no later than June 30th of 2014. This one-time payment of $20,000, which is not gonna be PERS compensable, would be able to be used for the following options. They could use it for entering into a deferred compensation plan or as a cash payment or a combination of thereof. Uh, the application window would be open from May 7th through June 21st. Uh, they would have then seven days to rescind their uh, option. Uh, the retirement resignation dates must take place by June 30th uh, to be effective. Uh, we are going seeking to cap the number of retirements at $260,000 in the buyout. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions in regards to this plan. Anybody have questions? Ms. I do. Uh, got Ms. Jordan and then Ms. Edra. Um, how many? How many would qualify for this? 
we are going to cap it at 13, the 260,000. Uh, you know, in, until it's offered, we really don't know how many people are going to take advantage of it. Uh, we're, we're thinking 10 to 12 may uh, take advantage of it just in, in dis early discussion, so. But how many, I, I'm trying to get the number, I know th max it at 13, but how many could? Because you have to have over 15, so I guess I'm asking how many oh. people are over 15 years? Oh. Okay. <laughs> For the record, Michelle Hobbs, Reno Fire. Uh, based on the 15 years of service, that would be 104 of the Reno Fire employees have more than 100 uh, have more than 15 years of service. So 104 of these letters, if agreed to, will go out. Ms. Sadra. Robert, can you tell us? Um, okay, so the plan would be we would be able to not have to lay off. Um, people who have less service, so on the bottom end of the employment ladder, so to speak, if we paid senior people who may already be planning to leave, if we paid them 20000 each to leave perhaps earlier than they were going to or they were going to leave next month anyway and they're just waiting around to see if they might get twenty grand, um, what would that net result be? When all is said and done, would we have one more firefighter on the ground after we did this kind of movement, or would we have one more fire station open and not have to brown out because of the, um, the budget conditions? What would the net result be? For the record, Mike Hernandez, Reno Fire Chief. Uh, specifically, all we are doing is shifting the number of people that are being uh, laid off we're offsetting that by the number of people that could potentially retire. But we the, would have the, to pay for them to retire. Correct. The, the staffing number that you will see on a day-to-day -day basis will not change, with the exception of the two positions that we've identified funding for, potentially identified funding for. Uh, but the, that, the boots on the ground number will not change. This so we is would only have the offsetting same number of people on our staff as is, is being proposed that includes unfortunately laying off 35 firefighters. Right. We would have the same number of, as you call it, boots on the ground, but we would have paid $20,000 to up to 13,000 people to allow us to have the same number of firefighters on the ground and the same number of stations opened. Absolutely correct. What we are doing in, by doing this is avoiding paying twice. And by that I mean we have individuals that could pretend, we and we don't know, that are either eligible or close to retirement that may or may not retire this year, this next fiscal year, they will incur separation costs, buyouts, et cetera. Likewise, the 35 that are slated to retire, I'm sorry, to be laid off, will incur costs, separation costs. So as the, the bottom 35 transition out of our department and get laid off, and then we have one, five, ten, six, however many people retire at the top end, we will be bringing back those individuals to keep our staffing levels constant. And, and that's what I mean when I say we, in essence, will be paying twice for the separation costs. Do you have an indication of how many senior members may want to? We, we again, these are, for, uh, for the record, Mike Hernandez, our chief, we look at our seniority list. I have been contacted by at least three, possibly uh, three to five individuals that said they have an interest in retiring, uh, but they got to look at their personal finances. They got to look at, you know, how is it going to impact their family? There, are, there is interest in, in individuals retiring. We look at seniority, age, where are they with respect to how many years of service, et cetera, and we, we recognize that there is a block of individuals that are eligible to retire that frankly could or could not. We won't know until we make this offer. And again, all we are doing is offsetting the people from the bottom end by the retirees at the top end. What's the pay differential? Chief, did you hear that question? I'm sorry. What's uh, the pay it, differential between it, a new it, boots on the ground versus a senior? It, it, it again, it would be depending on what the senior is, whether it's an RFDAA member, a battalion chief, or it's a captain. Uh, it could be about thirty to forty thousand dollar difference. It for you know, it, and and again, it depends on what, how many hours that person's working, what special pays they may be getting. So it's it's never, uh, you know, it's a general rule of thumb. But it would be equal to or more than the twenty thousand dollar buyout. Yeah. Okay. 
Mr. Manager, um, I know prior to your tenure there was a series of buyouts that the city did. Uh, have we done any performance evaluation to understand if those achieved the results that we had hoped to? Uh, I, I don't believe we have gone back and studied those. This is uh, slightly different than mm -hmm. what was offered in some of the other programs. They were offered buying years and uh, buying PERS time. This is a, a direct cash payment, so it's a little easier to quantify, but we did not go back and analyze that. Yeah, and I I, under, I can see the differences, and this is department specific. I guess you know I've got a 2013 article up in front of me from Governing Magazine, the magazine for states and locals, talking about buyouts, how they kind of come in vogue and out of vogue, and it says that you know in 2012 several municipalities, Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, Virginia County, and New York County offered them, and um, and you know the results are unclear if they if they reach that as a matter of fact New York State offered 4,000 and is kind of revoked their early buyout uh, one governor the governor of Alabama revoked early buyout offers for state employees I'm not quite sure that I am comfortable going there a lot of and the reason is a lot of times it's because it's ghost employees who are gonna who are gonna retire anyway um, you know maybe that's money. philosophical maybe it's just not data database um, I I want to um, bring resources to the fire department, but I think this is not about public safety. This is about more, you know, kind of who's, who are the booths, and I, I don't think this is the way to go about it. Well, by doing this, I think we save some dollars yeah. and stuff like this, and we keep some people uh, employed that are going to be laid off or would be laid off, and uh, personally, I support you on this. Mr. Dort, you had something? Are we ready for those, or we want to get them again? Huh? Let's go. Mr. Dorch, Mr. Dorch, have moved to adopt. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Any further discussion? Mr. Mayor. Yes. I think that this is um, not the right approach for us to be taking. If these employees have already expressed an interest in retiring, they should indeed exercise their right to retire, and particularly because you um, cannot show us that the early buyouts that we've offered before actually performed for us the way that we thought they would. We have no history to base this decision on other than the hope that these people um, will take the option and we can save um, from having to lay more people off. The net result to the service to our community isn't improved. It's still the same number of people and the same number of stations opened, correct? Uh, Robert Chisel, for the record, correct. <clears throat> How, however, part of the, the methodology and the reason we're proposing this is to, even if they retired six months or a year from now, we would be bringing back those firefighters we just laid off. And this creates a more seamless operation for our fire department instead of having the separation and then bringing someone back and we're causing uh, stress on those potential rift firefighters that will be hurt so that, totally, that was our intent I totally so. understand and have the same um, discomfort um, with the the people who would be laid off absolutely that goes without saying um, but for those who are looking to retire not to just do it because it's the right thing to do and wait to be paid to do it is wrong it's wrong but that's what's going to happen and just, and we're going to pay, if we lay these people off, we're going to pay separation for them. And when the others decide to retire, we're going to pay for those separation. Correct. So we're going to, just, we can save money by doing this. It, it's not the right thing, but I mean, it is, does save money for us. Yeah, and that's, and that's really the only driving factor with me, Mr. Mayor, is that, one, it saves us from laying off some of these, some of these firefighters that, that are on the list of being laid off. But... At the end of the day, when Robert first, or Robert or Andrew, one of them first approached me with this, I said, "Look, is is, is it going to cost us money? Is it going to save us money? If it saves us money, I'm all for it." And and the, the bottom line is that the guys that are getting laid off make a lot less than the guys that are getting ready to retire. So it does save us money. There is a fiscal element to this that's a benefit to this community, and that's that's why I support it. But in our plan, it doesn't even identify what it will save us. It identifies that it's going to cost us 200, potentially up to 220 grand, but it doesn't tell us what we'll save. 
No, it's not we, even in the report. No, we, we cannot identify how much the actual savings is because we don't know who is going to take advantage of it. And until we know who takes advantage of it and the impact on the reduction in the RIFs, we won't be able to quantify it. How did we get to the 20000 Where would that figure come from? Uh, Reno Fire Chief Mike Hernandez. I believe that was the previous dollar figure that was offered uh, back in 2002. And we looked at the uh, we looked at the PERS. We, we generally looked at what the PERS uh, buyout would be for six months and, and a year, and it, it kind of averaged out to about twenty thousand dollars. But again, this goes back to what our previous offer was back in two thousand two. And what was the interest in that? Then? I'm sorry. What was the interest level in it at that time? Uh, I I wasn't here, so I don't I don't know. So. Quite a few. Good afternoon, Mayor Council. Uh, for the record, Cadence Matievich, Assistant City Manager. Um, I, I was an employee at that time. I was not part of the executive management at that point. Um, I think an important distinction to make would be the difference between what the intent of the program that was offered at that time and the program that's being offered, uh, the intent of this particular program. At that time, we, we were looking um, at, at the reality that we were going to have to reduce staff across the board in, in the city. And so um, it was an incentive program that was offered not just to people who potentially uh, were, were at the end of their careers or looking at retiring. Um, we, we had a number of members who, uh, th there were thresholds, but, but at that time, uh, what the what the separation did was create vacancies that were held over time and those were intended to generate savings um, in, in general fund positions um, of people who, who perhaps were, you know, were on the fence about maintaining their employment with the city of Reno, which is a little different uh, than, than I, I think what the outcome that we're hoping to achieve with this, which is to retain some, uh, you know, of our, of our more junior staff, if you will. Um, and in this, you know, in these cases there, you know, even our junior staff has been with us for a number of years. Um, so uh, Councilwoman Zadra, I think it would be, um, while we don't have the analysis for you on the effectiveness of that program, I don't know that it's exactly an equitable calculation because at that point we were looking to create vacancies that, that would remain permanent vacancies for long-term savings over subsequent budget years. Where here, we're trying to avoid the cost of separation, uh, both the, the cost of payout at the time that we separate those, those firefighters that might be laid off. There are additional costs around unemployment insurance uh, that we would not incur uh, moving into the next fiscal year uh, if, if we don't, in fact, uh, if those firefighters do in fact remain unemployed um, and some of the folks who have more tenure who were looking at retirement move move into the to the next opportunities of their life no miss mr. mayor and council I mean the only other thing I would point out is that you know if we offer this incentive and nobody takes it and let's say we have three employees it's sixty thousand dollars so I mean, the, the 260 is only spent if we get 13 retirees to take advantage of it. And I will point out that we're offering them 20,000, and as Mr. Chisel stated, the difference in annual salary is 30 to 40, depending on the type of person that retires. Mr. Mayor, I think we have motions on the table. Yes. If the body thinks it's premature, as I do, to make this um, vote right now, because we haven't really closed out the fire budget discussion no. from earlier today, and I'd like to revisit that, maybe that would be more informed to people about how they'll vote on this. I Otherwise, agree. we can call for the vote. I agree with uh, Councilman Bruckus, because I think it is premature. Okay. Especially since we don't know what the cost motion. savings is. We have a motion on the floor. We have a second. You had something, Mr. Kringer? Mr. Mayor, I just want to clarify for council, if, if we're talking about delaying this action until you get to the other action on the budget, that is fine. But we'll, I, what I will point out is we cannot delay this beyond today. Um, well, given I think the, we understood that. Okay. Okay. I mean, to me, the, the issue regarding the fire budget and this are two separate issues. I, I, I don't I don't know why we would wait to do this. I mean, I don't mind waiting, but I don't know why we would wait because it's it, I don't think they relate to each other. So I, I don't see the, the benefit of waiting. But I, I mean, it doesn't matter if we do it now or a half hour from now. You want to withdraw your motion and we'll do it? 
Uh, it, I mean, I don't, I don't know how the, I don't know how the discussion on the budget is going to change anybody's mind up here. I mean, that's the only thing I'm saying, Mr. Mayor. I, I it's a separate issue. It is. I'm, I'm with. I seconded the motion. I, to me, it's all, it's all the same. I, I'm, I'm in line with what Councilman Dorch is saying. I mean, uh, if we're looking to give approval for the counts for the staff to go ahead and ask if somebody wants to retire, right? To allow for these junior guys to keep their jobs, and that's, that's going to be the discussion. So I mean. Uh, I mean, either way, if it appeases the council, yeah. I'm more than happy to I, reconsider and we can I, talk about it again. I also would like to point out the, these individuals, these younger firemen with, and their families have been through this process once already, correct? Some of them too. The senior ones that we're looking to potentially give this incentive to or, or put this out there for them, they've not been faced with this previously, correct? Uh, Reno Fire Chief Mike Hernandez, you're correct, ma'am. Uh, the individuals that would qualify for this are senior most tenured firefighters. Uh, they are closing their fire career chapters as we, <laughs> as we speak. And uh, some of them are nearing the end of the last page. Some of them are halfway through. But they are in a position where they can actually consider this offer and it would be a determining factor whether or not they elect to, to take advantage of this or to stay employed for another year or two. We frankly will not know until we put it out there. There is interest and I believe that we, it would have a positive effect on the, um, the individuals that are, that are scheduled to be laid off. And as the, the manager indicated, we have a, a certain timeline that we are mandated by federal law uh, there's a 45-day window, and within that window, the individuals that do apply can rescind their letters or they can actually throw their letter in to be considered. Uh, we, will not know, not, we won't know a final count until the 28th, 29th, or the 30th of June. So we are literally going to be telling people they've got a job or they don't have a job the day before we actually give other individuals uh, the pink slip to walk out the door. Yeah. So that, that's why it, it's yeah. it, think, timing I is imperative. I think that issues. this, if we do this, support this, mm -hmm. all we're doing is giving the staff another tool to work with. Mm -hmm. This doesn't affect the budget. It doesn't do a thing. It does give the staff another tool to work with. I think you can call for the vote, Mr. Mayor. Call for the vote. Can you explain the how it doesn't affect the budget, though? Where would the 260 come from? How does that not affect the uh, budget? This is all going to take, Robert Chisel, this is going to take place in this fiscal year as opposed to next fiscal year. That's why it's all before June 30th. So all the transactions, the payment, the 260 will come out of this current fiscal year, not next fiscal year. Under what budget area, budget line? For the record, Kate Thomas, Office of Management Budget, we're evaluating that right now. We've got salary savings in some areas that we're targeting to appropriate towards this. Um, we would, again, as was previously discussed, we would be seeing those separation costs regardless. So we've been queuing this up for a little bit of time now, but we'll be coming forward with you to you with an augmentation to depict where those ultimately end up. And we don't know what the amount's going to be. Correct. And we won't. <laughs> till for till your long. average firefighter who would be eligible for this, what's 20000 a month work, you know, so a month, a month I mean, or two what months. What do you mean that's not a month? It's two months, three months. What is it? Are you speaking in regard to their current salary? Yeah, if they decided to work, you know, a 20 year captain, if he decides to, 25 year captain, Roughly. two months. Okay, so he's like, oh, I can leave two months early. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I tell you, I think we're making a mistake if we don't give them a tool to work with. Pretty good, Mr. Mayor. The vote's called. All in favor say aye. 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 Those that oppose, no. 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 Show the vote. Five, four, three. Four, three. Four, three. All right. Now, before we get back into the beginning of this thing, we do have a public comment about the, uh, the Fire Building uh, Enterprise Fund. Mr. Dillon, would you come up, please? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Mike Dillon. I'm the executive director for the Builders Association of Northern Nevada. Mr. Mayor and distinguished members of the council, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. Um, first of all, so I'm speaking um, today in 
opposition to the item that was brought up that I did not realize was going to be spoken about today of shifting from funds from the building enterprise fund uh, for other purposes, um, which appear to be uh, fire related. Um, I first want to give a positive uh, um, positive comment for the Community Development Department. Uh, through the Building Enterprise Fund and, and through the stakeholders for which I represent, which is 500 companies uh, in the building and construction industry in town, uh, we have never seen uh, the outstanding efficiencies and the proactive ways that the uh, this organization is moving forward to, to help the industry and follow the timelines that were brought up and staff appropriately. From a historical perspective, um, I just want to talk about real quickly the process in which some of these uh, proposals have come up when, when fees have been increased. I've been here since 2004, so I'm, I'm very aware of it, but there's been some definitely uh, some problems in the Enter Enterprise Fund uh, that were discussed earlier. And uh, we've worked extremely, extremely hard to make sure that we've all come forward with a process that we uh, agree to, which is uh, the proper way to handle these type of issues, whether it's, whether it's the right thing to do or not, is that this needs to be brought to the Building Enterprise Fund. We have people on that committee that are very responsible. They're stakeholders in this community, and they have all uh, want to do what is right to staff the, uh, staff the city of Reno appropriately for their needs. Uh, whatever department that is, whether it's planning, building, code enforcement, um, any fire review, any of these things. So um, these are open public meetings that are all notified. Uh, these departments have had the opportunity to come there and talk if they had a concern before, and that has not been done. So um, I'm sure that they can be put on the agenda for the, the next meeting, and, and I'm sure this can be handled and scheduled by the staff appropriately to make sure that we are um, hearing and uh, discussing these issues. It gives an opportunity for the stakeholders to actually have a discussion with those department heads um, to get into the reasoning for why they might want some of these things to happen, um, whether, you know, if they're, if, if they're not addressing their uh, their needs for uh, funding the review time or whatever the argument is. So um, with that, again, I would just talk, I, I want you to really think about the process and we have a good process that works. Um, I was frankly shocked today to see this here before you without, um, without the stakeholders being notified or in front of the Building Enterprise Fund. Thank you, that concludes my remarks. Thank you very much. I agree with you. I think I, we put a lot of things on the agenda where the stakeholders have no idea what is going on. So I really want to sort of emphasize that to staff. And I really appreciate you coming, Mr. Dillon, and letting us know that. But this happens quite often. And so I can understand your frustration. I'm sorry. OK. This, um... Well, I'd like to, if I may, talk a little bit more about are, what, what do you plan to move on to about, are you responding to the builder's comments? Okay, well, this morning I, I felt that, I, while I think there's a nexus that can be explained as a matter of process, and it's really getting back to Council Member Zadra's, you know, position about how we use our volunteers, and I, I do think she's right. I think the safer grant loss put us all in a jam that we know about, and that's why it, it probably would have been brought to the BFAC for consideration. But um, maybe now it, it does. But having said that, I'm, I'm very concerned about, you know, this was going to be possibly two more firefighters. And I'm, I'm tremendously concerned, even though we just uh, did this buyout, it doesn't help boots on the ground. And I am, I am very concerned. And, and I have a proposal that I want to bring up for a budgetary offset. And, um, and that is one that I've discussed quite a bit uh, over the last year. Last year, about this time, we talked about the Tumwa right-of-way. It's essentially our franchise fee from Tumwa, which is about $1.9 million. S some point in time, the city council dedicated that to the road budget for local roads, which is what the city maintains. They do that in addition with a long-standing property tax override. 
and I think it's about $1.9 million, which you would equate to maybe 13 or 14 for firefighters. I believe that the risk to our community, our growing community, I might add, I've been watching the subdivision activity very closely, the multifamily activity. Uh, we are a growing community again, and I feel we are at risk um, with losing the 35. And whatever we can do, if it's one or two, I think it will help the bottom line. And so um, I'd just like to show that um, for the, you know, part of the theme of the one region has been that, or uh, the smart city is that we're one region. And when I look region wide, I see that the voters through the, um, 2010 fuel indexing tax in Washoe County created a lot of resources for transportation funding. And some of those resources are not coming down to the city for local funding of our roads. Um, and I'd like to put a, just so everyone can see how much the taxpayers are committing and have come up on revenues for the area of transportation and how I think this $1.9 million that the city is paying out of our funds um, for, ro for roads should be allocated for fire. This is presented to the April 18th board of the RTC. It's the, just like the Reno City Council salaries, the Washoe County fuel tax is indexed to uh, consumer price indexing, more or less. And so in 2010, when the voters said, yes, we want to tax ourselves for transportation in this region, uh, well, RTC was getting 3.2 million. Last year, that that pot of money dedicated for transportation dollars went up to 24 million. It's pro projected, and this is the, um, the statement be below the arrow, for the 2014 budget for uh, 32 million. So it's just got a cost curve that's going up. And some of that, a modest amount, goes back to the local governments. But I think the city of Reno's policy to the RTC needs to be that it needs to back out money to the city to do local road projects. That'll free us up to put money into uh, firefighters. I think it's really where our highest needs are. You know, people say, well, you want to rob from Peter to pay Paul? That's the landscape we exist in right now. And so I'm prepared to uh, suggest to the council that the Tumwa right-of-way of $1.9 million be dedicated to maintain whatever firefighters uh, are on the layoff list so we can build up the forces that much. Um, and then with that, a similar motion that our RTC representatives make ground to this, make a case to the RTC board to allocate some of this increment over next year's fiscal on the RTC money for local roads, proportionately. So Sparks can take a look at it too, and Washoe County. Now, it may not come in RTC's budget this year. I haven't been to RTC's budget meetings lately. I went to one. Um, but they are fat, they are robust. This has nothing to do with Southeast Connector. That money's already allocated. It has to do with other projects and priorities, including the Northeast Connector. But um, I think it's clear that there's a lot of money going to transportation and we're getting short on other services here. So. Uh, what impact would that have on our roads though? It would have an impact on our roads if the money is not brought out of the RTC budget for local roads this year. And I'm, I'm willing, for one year, and maybe it's explained to if this goes through to the firefighters, the 13 or 14, is look, we bought a little time, we're looking at all the region's revenue in total mm -hmm. to see how they're allocated. Because that is the smarter region. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> the taxpayers right. only dedicate so much money. And they really stood up for transportation. And so those dollars need to be thought of as transportation dollars, whether they're in our fund, the counties, or RTCs. But that's, they did vote for the money to go to RTC. In my understanding, our two representatives are meeting right now on these very issues uh, with Washoe County and the City of Sparks uh, right now. It's and the same many? discussion? Yes. Huh? Yeah. We, we, no, there's not a second. No, 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 no I was saying there is a discussion going That's on, and to give a little bit more information on this, um, RTC being a regional board requires regional support for an action such as this. Otherwise, it is a temporary fix, and we've already seen with the SAFER grant what a temporary fix the situation it puts us in. So we are working with our regional partners at RTC to approach this as uh, a region um, to gain ground for a long-term sustainable um, funding, as you've suggested. We're not there yet, and my fear is by doing this in a somewhat 
siloed manner is going to jeopardize our work that we've already done on this um, on this issue. And it and it again it band aids potentially band aids something that needs a long term solution. Mm -hmm. well, but I'm glad you're looking at solutions. Sorry. I mean I think that that's that is exactly kind of thinking that we need to start to look at. I do. Tracy we're Chase, looking at region-wide solutions, region-wide solutions with the three entities that represent that board. Right. Um, City Council is getting to the point where you're going to give direction on the budget. I wanted just to bring your attention uh, to the item before you. It is direction on a proposed budget, which you will not adopt until your official budget hearing. So. If you have a specific matter you would like to bring back, whatever it may be, it may require a specific notice under open meeting law. This is just general direction on the budget at this point in time. If there's some agreement that you want to look into or affect, that would be need to be separately noticed. And I understand that. This is specific to essentially what Tumla pays us for our right-of-way toll. It's like a franchise in lieu of a franchise fee. I think our need is this year. I brought this up last year. I think we're going to be putting the community at risk this drought season with 12 or 13 firefighters. Uh, I think that could make a difference. And, um, and I think, and I appreciate that our representatives have taken this onto the RDC board, but somehow maybe us making this motion will, will call that the need is great and within our is. budgets. And, um, and maybe the others will take a look and see that this is the right thing to do to help us out and maybe helpful to them too. Mr. Delgado. What's, what, what's in the budget for right now? Uh, in terms of if, if Jenny's looking at the 1.9 or something, what, what's the whole bucket look like now? So currently the right of way toll that's budgeted for fiscal 15 is $1.9 million going into the street fund. So, and so essentially you're looking at just taking away the street fund completely? Is that what I'm hearing? I am with the hope that if not this budget season, next budget season it will be backfilled. I would hope that this year with RTC showing that they've got an additional $8 million coming through index fuel that there is revenue within their budget. So we're going to so be our hope, Yeah, so Excuse go, me, I'm sorry, yeah, go please. No, 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 I was just saying it, it, so it sounds like our hope is that we would be able to take this money from the street fund, get the firefighters going, and hopes that RTC will, as a region, say it's okay to move forward and not do anything for the streets in the city of Reno. Um, and, and knowing that our two board members are currently working on that, uh, it may, it's a little concerning to me that maybe next year we'll be in the same bucket of when I asked the chief before earlier the last time is saying, um, the firefighters are hating having to come back every time and having their jobs kind of laid out if we're not looking at the long-term sustainability. Uh, I mean, I'm all for saving what we can, but it, the things don't look like we're setting up for the long term here, and we're just trying to band-aid Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, too, if I might, the, the $1.9 million that comes into there, the, the capital program of the street fund budget for next year is, is budgeted at two and a half million. So if you pull out the 1.9 million, you take a two and a half million capital budget down to 600,000. Now to put that in perspective, I met with Mr. Flansburg yesterday, our street identified need on an annual basis is 14 million. So even at two and a half million, we're not even coming close to the need on the street program. And now if you take that down to 600,000, if the RTC funds do not materialize, that's a significant hit to the street fund budget. And if I can channel my inner John Flansburg, that would uh, essentially eliminate the neighborhood street program. That $2.5 million or the 1.9 would eliminate that. And our ability um, to, should we have a heavy snow year, we would have to come forward to you with a request for the contingency fund because that's also where that money is identified to help us from. What if we have a heavy fire year? Exactly. It's well, all about priorities. It, well, it is, but I also, Mr. Dillon brought up a good point when he said that, that this issue was not brought before them, what he believed was a, a regional issue relative to um, building enterprise fund. This, the same argument can be made for this RTC. We're wanting to approach this as a regional, uh, you know, direction, and we need to make sure that we've got our regional partners on board and we're doing it together and we're not doing something in a manner that um, is siloed and that's my fear here is we're doing something very siloed and very temporary 
We're, we're banking on, and we're going to bank on tomorrow on money that we don't know we will or won't get. And I understand the need, absolutely. But I, boy, I'd hate to be sitting back here a year from now having the same discussion. We get enough phone calls and complaints on roads now. Mr. Mayor. And yes. First, I, I, I want to say to Jenny, thanks for trying to come up with some solution. Sure. I don't, I don't, I don't support the one you're proposing because I, I don't think we can gut our street program any more than we've already done. Um, but at least you're trying to bring something to the table. Um, and, and I would encourage yeah, I think the, that's the people, fantastic. the people that the people that actually voted against the layoffs mm -hmm. to put their proposal on the table. I mean, mm -hmm. four million dollars short. If you don't want it, I mean, you voted against the layoffs for the firefighters. Well, let's Where's look that at property million? tax from baseball. Those kinds of things. Let's look, look gonna, at all those things. So if we're, if we're going to talk about what we're going to propose, I mean, that's, then we'll go This is the chance. There. I mean, this is, we're at a budget meeting. Okay. This is the chance to to come up with four million dollars to to prevent those layoffs. Okay. Where is the RTC budget in its process? Because I went to the first budget meeting and it looked pretty robust. And so that went into my bearing. We could go ramp making up franchise proposal. fee. We could go, um, you know, I know you, oh, one time fee from RTC. We could, I mean, there's, there's ways, I mean, different ways to skin a cat. Right? What, what fee are you I'm just saying. To? Which, yeah, what, 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 what fee are you You're saying to? if we're wanting to come to the table about how we're going to come up with this $4 million, there's a lot of different ways you can skin a cat. So whether your way is the right way or the wrong way, Right, and that, we're trying and to come up with a solution. I, mean, I appreciate okay. her bringing something to the right. table. Yeah, I don't, right. I don't okay. support that one. Okay, all right. But I, just I mean, my to point clarify. was that that you know, last week you voted against the layoffs, but there's no money. I mean, I, I, so where's the money going to come from if you don't want it? If we're not going to lay those 35 firefighters off, where's the money going to come from? Well, there's different ways that we can skin a cat. Like I just said, you can pay the property tax from baseball. It can be a one-time fee from the property tax from baseball. I thought, I thought we I thought we settled that vote already. I thought we made that vote already. We did, but Dwight's trying so, to bring it back. Know, so I'm trying to tell you whatever you your just, priorities are, then you can figure it out. I, I thought we made that vote. I think we're talking on something else now. Yeah. And so let, let let's me, stick to that. Let me interrupt you all one minute and that'll let everybody settle down. Mr. Dillon has a correction he'd like to make, and so I'm going to recognize Mr. Dillon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. For the record, Mike Dillon, Builders Association of Northern Nevada. I just wanted to make sure that you understand that, um, you know, while, while we're we were frustrated to see this item, we have a great communication with Community Development Department, and there hasn't been time to schedule, like Councilman Breckus had discussed, um, a Building Enterprise Fund Committee um, prior to this meeting today, but we would look forward to having that item brought up. Sorry to get off track, but I want to make sure that was clear on the record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and Mr. Mayor, just to add on to that, I mean, it was a timing issue on the building enterprise piece of this, and it's my understanding that the BFAC was communicated to. There just wasn't time to schedule a meeting between the last, you know, the last budget workshop and today. So to say that there was, you know, that they were, weren't notified, they were notified, they just didn't have the ability to agendize it on one of their meetings. All right. Mr. Dart's run the meeting a minute. I got to. Take a little break. So we, I guess we need to get back to... Let's take a five-minute recess. Call the meeting back to order. Ms. Mr. Mayor, uh, to continue this discussion, I'm wondering if the chief is around. I'd like to ask him what $1.9 million would do to, to, would result in boots on the ground. Can we, can we, can we see if we've got any consensus up here to move that? I mean, if you're the only person that's looking to move the 1.9 million, then I don't think there's a reason to move forward with the discussions. Well, if we have an understanding what the operational results would be, maybe that'll help inform people. I, I, I uh, there's nothing he that I, can, I mean I don't know how everyone else feels, but there's there's nothing that he can say that's going to make that's going to get me to want to move the 1.9 million out of our street fund. What if it opens up another station? It's not going to get me to move the 1.9 million out but of our street it? fund. No, would it? No, I don't, 
It wouldn't, or it would. Chief, you got to come on up and get in the middle of the brawl. Mr. Mayor, if I can just jump in, <laughs> 1.9 million would uh, be enough to fund 16 firefighters. For the record, Mike Hernandez, Fire Chief, 16 firefighters, possibly one extra. We just have to look at it, but that would open up one fire station and increase our floaters by five, uh, four, four positions. But that funding is not yeah. securely identified or sustainable. Well, it guts our street fund completely. All right. Now we're back for discussion. And we're Mi Mr. 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 Mayor, staff has put together a, a slide um, that has a bullet point for each decision that we would ask council to make today. Um, as you see, Mr. Mayor and Council, the first decision up there is the additional fire personnel. Um, we presented 15 um, last uh, at our last budget workshop. We presented two additional positions today. So we would ask Council to, to go down the list uh, and make decisions on each one of these items. Okay, so now on the additional firefighters, we're going to take action on the two first and then... Yeah, Ms. Mr. Mayor, we're looking for action on the whole package. So if there's disagreement on the 15, the two, whatever it is, we, I, I need a consensus from the, the council to move forward so that when we get to the 20th, we present what the consensus of the council is. Okay, now the, so that everybody's clear, the 15 you're talking about. We've already funded that. We've already got that well, funded. We funded, and, and I just... I just, I just don't want there to be, I don't want to be accused of, of not representing the majority when we come back on the 20th, that's all. Right. Mr. Mayor, Tracy Chase, again, the uh, motion under the open meeting law would be to bring back as part of the budget at the budget hearing these items in the fashion that you direct. Well, I, I can start. I am, can, um, Mr. Uh, Dillon's comments on process resonate with me. So I am not prepared to propose a mod. I am, I don't know. That's not a modification to the, the, the budget we have before us is what the manager presented. So that would be a modification. I'm, I'm saying we don't go with that modification. I, I, and I would agree. And I think even, even if we have the funding identified, I, I, I don't think keeping those two firefighters benefits us from a public safety standpoint. So if we have, if we can identify funding, I think that we need to start having some discussions with REMSA about us contracting with them to have um, a rescue unit up at either in the Somerset area, wherever it would be identified that's the most important. I think that's the direction we need to go is start identifying where we can place additional rescue units and contract with REMSA for those additional units. Um, because we can't do that with, with, in our system. Um, and I think we, that would have a direct benefit to public safety. Um, Mayor, I'd like to, I like the idea of saving two additional firefighters. I like the idea that the chief had proposed that, that those floating, uh, when people are taking vacations and such, that they would fill in so we wouldn't reduce any more or pr increase the brownouts. Um, if we're able to, I don't think the funding's been allocated, the funding's been shown and how they'd be able to do that. I don't see it as a taking from Peter, giving to Paul, I think it's just, or vice versa. It's, uh, yeah, the funding's there, it's been allocated, just giving it to the right person, the jobs that they've been doing. So I'd, I'd like to see the council support the two additional firefighters. Is there any legal ramifications to seeing how the um, building enterprise folks weren't included in it? I mean, is there some, by us taking this action today, is there some legal recourse? M Mr. Mayor and, and Council and, and Mr. Turnier can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the BFAC is an advisory committee. Um, so I don't think there's any legal restrictions there. Is there any restrictions? Because that was created by the legislature? Fred Turnier, Community and Development Director. Uh, yes, under NRS, I, I think it's 354 for Enterprise. Uh, that you do have an advisory uh, board made up of uh, the people receiving the services to provide recommenda recommendations and advice to the city council regarding the functions of the building enterprise. But how does it say to spend the money? 
Uh, standard practice has been that we would bring a, a copy of the budget uh, before the, the BFAC <laughs> and get solicit their input regarding uh, the budget and performance measurements that is funneled up to the City Council. Uh, we do have a, a BFAC meeting tentatively scheduled for next week. Um, and we just have one scheduled for next week, which includes a discussion regarding um, this, uh, this proposal about the, the two, uh, uh, the fire plans checking and also indirect rates. Because. If I might add that the d aligning the revenues with the expenditures does fall in line with generally accepted accounting principles. Okay, because I was led to believe earlier visiting with somebody that there was some legal ramifications of taking money from the builder's fund uh, without working with them and stuff like that. Mayor, if I might, and this is a suggestion, a suggestion would be for a motion from council would be to fund the 15 additional that we identified at the last budget workshop and then contingent upon a recommendation from the BFAC fund to additional positions. Mr. Dart, would you add something? No, Mr. Mayor, I, I, I mean, I, I don't support that position, as I stated before. You know, I, again, to, to, to fund these two positions doesn't help us from a public safety standpoint. We can't open another fire station. We aren't providing any additional services to the public. We're just hiring two different two additional firefighters. But we're not could. getting. We're not providing any additional services. We're not. We're not providing a two-engine truck. Rescue truck, we're not providing, we're, th those funds are being wasted in my opinion, and we could take those funds if they are available, which I don't know, I mean, I think that's a discussion, I do agree that that's a discussion we have to have with the BFAC, but if those funds are available, I think we could take those and, and, at, and at least have some conversations with REMSA to contract with them for an additional rescue unit, which is the majority of our calls anyway, the vast majority do that of our calls. Already? Does REMSA not provide that service for us? We have to go back to contract for them to do that? I'm saying uh, to have one stationed in, up either at Somerset, which is probably um, for a rescue unit, probably the most need right now. Um, if we were going to, if, if we wanted one stationed there, we would have to contract with them. Or we could contract with someone else. I'm but, just saying we, they, provi they could provide that ser service. We could contract with them. They do provide the service throughout the city. You're absolutely right. But if we want one stationed there, we would have, I, would, I would think we would have to contract with them. They're not just going to provide that service for us. Well, I mean, to your point, that two positions doesn't give it us that much. I think we have a little process problem. But the, the 1.9 gives us what I think makes us comfortable. I, I really do. And I'm, I'm not saying we have a lot of data here. I've been trying to gleam answers in the 2006 fire uh, audit report, um, which, you know, hesitates or suggests some risk, but the 1.9, I think, is where we need to put our needs, <laughs> our, our resources. Uh, how many people would we need, firefighters, would we need to open up another fire station? Oh. Reno Fire Chief Mike Hernandez, we would need a minimum of 12, uh, four individuals per shift times three, plus the additional uh, staff to compensate for vacation, holiday, leave, that's, a, that, that's why we say 17, 16 individuals would get us one station plus additional float. And that would, in, in this particular scenario, that would directly open up fire station or keep fire station number 10 uh, open. Okay. Okay, so we have, uh, we are voting on the additional fire uh, the 15. I don't have a motion yet. Do I? Yeah, I don't no, I don't have a motion yet. <laughs> but we're talking about saving and uh, taking care of the 15. And um, we're doing each of these individually, right? Hmm? We're taking yeah. each one of these on individually. Yes, all the way down. Correct. So right now, would we make a motion to fund the 15 and then make another motion for the other two? Is that what we're doing? Mm -hmm. Because the two won't open up anything, but it should help us with overtime okay. and stuff like but that. But we need the BFAS impact. Yeah, but we're not reducing our overtime budget at all. I mean, it's, and, and I understand exactly what the chief's saying. But, you know, today, for a perfect example, how many, I mean, we've got how many firefighters that are not assigned to a truck today, chief? 
that are, I mean, they're floaters that don't have a job to do today for the next 48 hours. Actually, we are completely staffed today. And uh, so how many we, are not assigned to a truck today? We may have, I, I'm going to have to, I, I really don't want to answer that until I speak with my operations chief, but I think we have maybe one or maybe one additional personnel, possibly two. That's because everybody came to work today. But um, before I, before you quote me on that, let me run upstairs and verify with my ops chief to see exactly what our headcount right is. I do know that today okay, we had can. zero vacation and we had um, no sick leave. No, so no quite just we were came fully in the staffed. Door. Excuse me? Look what just came in the oh, door. there we go. <laughs> How you like that, Chief? Threw you right under the bus. Good afternoon. Uh, Tim O'Brien, Division Chief, Randall Fire. I, I was in the elevator. I missed a question. So, <laughs> sorry. Somebody could repeat. How many? I mean, I know today, I guess, we're fully staffed. So, And how many floaters do we have today that aren't assigned to a truck? Uh, none. I thought Everybody, I, everybody's assigned today. I thought we had additional beyond that, though, is what the chief had said earlier. What are you talking about? I, I, I don't understand it. All stations are open today. Station 19's up today. Right. But I thought, Chief, I thought you said we had more people than we had. Well, this, this morning when we were doing our head count, we had no people on vacation, no people on sick leave, and we were struggling to place them. And... At that time, I uh, since then, I'm, I'm assuming we've placed them, so. Yeah, we, we, we would move an, an additional person onto the truck, so you'd, you'd run five on a truck in a scenario like you were suggesting. Oh, okay. So yeah. we've got, that's what I mean. So we're, we are actually overstaffed today. Uh, well, it would depend on the time of day. We actually had to, uh, because of some training, we actually moved some companies around. Uh, so, I mean, Station 19 right. was vacant for part of the day because we were using those personnel somewhere else in the system. To cover, so I would say no. We weren't overstaffed. Well, you know what I think I'd like to have is a motion for the 15 subject, and then uh, make the other two another motion after we visit with the uh, builders. Let's do it all now. So well, let's. We need a motion to go forward. Go, excuse me. So, Mr. Mayor, we would bring back the two post the BFAC meeting then, right. is what and, I'm understanding. We might have to have another meeting, and if we do, and we, we can, schedule it. And we can just bring it to a regular council meeting, potentially. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I think you're looking for a vote for each one of those bullet items. So yep. I will offer one for um, that we agree or accept staff's recommendation that um, there is funding in the um, c coming fiscal year's budget for 15 additional fire, per fire personnel. That's what I was looking for. Now, do second. I have a second? Second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Those that oppose, no. Motion carries unanimously. Now we're going down to core services review. Oh, oh, wait a second. We have to make a motion for the second. The second. I, I would make a motion that following the outcome of the BFAC meeting next week, that uh, the staff bring us the BFAC recommendation on those cost interchanges with the general fund and uh, enterprise fund uh, for consideration for to add to with whatever the BFAC recommendation is. And that would be with an understanding that we would have that at our official public hearing on the budget or we would schedule another um, budget meet um, Mayor, manager's workshop. Manager's discretion maybe? The, it, if I heard correctly for before, the BFAC meeting is on the 12th. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So we, we could put this on the uh, agenda on the 14th, actually. Mr. Mayor, Tracy Chase, Reno City Attorney's Office. There have been email, Mr. Manager, that is going around on that BFAC that it had to be canceled due to a noticing issue. So that may take into consideration what you needed to bring back. <coughs> Uh, Fred Trenier, Community Development Director. Actually, that's what I was going to bring up, uh, that we are looking at early next week um, to have that, that BFAC meeting. And then we can forward on a memo to the City Council uh, regarding the outcome of the recommendations from the BFAC on, on that day for, for the 14th. So, yeah. So, Mayor, <coughs> Mayor and Council, we will put that on the May 14th agenda um, pending the outcome from the BFAC committee. So, real quick, so what, I'm, what I'm hearing is we're going to 
put aside saving two other firefighter jobs so we can meet with the BFAC group, hear recommendations from them, whether we approve or, or not approve their recommendation, then we're going to see whether we can save another two firefighters. Are we going to wait for that? And I have a motion from Mr. Delgado. No, I, I want to, I'd rather do it now. I want to <laughs> push it out, just get it done. But I would make the motion, as was just described, that we give direction to staff to um, meet with the Enterprise Fund, get their input and recommendations. Um, we receive their recommendation in concurrence with staff's recommendation at our posted council meeting for next Wednesday. And we'll take action on it at that time. That's a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Those that oppose, no. Motion carries. 6-1. Six, 6-1. Six, 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 okay. 6-1. Mr. Uh, Manager, before we go on to car services, I would make a motion that we dedicate the $1.9 million from Tom Watoll to the fire budget to save up to 17 firefighter positions. That's not on the agenda. Well, any, this is, it's budget, it's budget, it's a budget item. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, this is direction to bring back as part of the final budget. This isn't final action on the final budget, and each of these items at, will be, in, it's just basically saying it will be included in your future meeting at that budget. I've got a motion. Second. I have a second. I have a I'm second. Gonna second that discussion. Because I, I think that we have to put public safety first. I know you guys feel differently about it. We'll agree to disagree. And, um, no, no, let, well, let me I, correct. I don't, I don't feel I just, differently about I, public safety. Let me, let me get okay. on the record. I, I the just, dollars, the 1.9, are not dedicated and secured dollars for a sustainable uh, securing of these firefighter jobs at, at this time. And for that reason, I do not believe it is a viable long-term solution to this problem. Okay. Nor do and we I have guarantee that, that um, RTC and the um, members who represent Sparks and Washoe County would agree to come in and backfill for the city if we were to take those dollars away and have nothing in our street fund. We have no guarantee that those um, board members would um, complement that action at You're the gonna RTC. Have discussions anyway. Absolutely. Okay. You Good. know, but I okay. think I think if we did this, we have made a statement that this is our highest priority from RTC. Councilman Zadra, when we were going through our liaisons and our appointments, I asked you what your priority for being on the RTC board was over this year, and you said a crosswalk like Moa and Elaine. You know, I think maybe we need to get to a point as a body to talk about what our priorities are regionally. You asked me what projects I was working on, and that is one that I offered, okay. and it was completed, correct. If the completed, term was a project, correct. that's right. But for me, I think that it's an idea that's been out here. We have budgetary risk, and I think it's one that I, I think that and we the need community to look has at. the community has infrastructure risks. This vote, I think, will set a uniform position that that is our priority for RTC funds, and it's not like RTC funds are not growing. I don't think you, you can't draw that line. You can't draw that line today, I, and I, I don't mean, want to be. And you're eliminating one of the core services that we have to offer our our, our citizens. Eliminating it. I understand that, and I, I know very well our street network. I know that the, ADT, you know, the ADTs and our pavement management uh, program and where we've been, I've been following that very closely. Uh, we accelerated a little bit, but I am willing to take a $600,000 local street budget this next construction season and that risk that, that comes with in order to make our, our city safer this uh, budget year, and I hope my colleagues will join me on this. Okay, I have a motion in the Can second. I ask the, the chief really quick? This is a general question. He's been asked several different times, but um, chief, are we, are, are we going to, you've looked at this back, forwards, and forwards in any, every, every different way. Are we, are we safe with what we have currently with the layoffs that we're going to have, possibly, for the 33, I'm assuming? We are safe. We can be safer. You know, the fact that we are closing a station is a significant impact to this community and our, our ability to serve and service certain regions of this community. Would I like to see a station open? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I concur that we need to have sustainability, uh, but you know, to, the short answer is yes, we can adequately serve our community and we will continue to adequately serve our community. Will our response times be impacted? Absolutely. Will our districts grow? Absolutely. 
but we will continue to meet our objectives in the best manner possible. And, and do you Chief, want to come back and, next year, Chief? Do you want to come back next year and talk about possible layoffs again? No, I do not. Because okay. <laughs> absolutely, well, not. What, how, I don't think anybody does. Disaster. Right. Sure, but we have. But I'm looking at. I mean, I'm. I mean, I'm all for trying to get some more. stuff set up, but I'm trying to look at it from. Uh, you know, we want to look at this from the best, the best position forward, and it frustrates me more than anything else when we find some some band aid stuff, in hopes that other revenue is going to open up for us. And that's why I was asking you whether we're going to be safe or not. Well, and, and from what I'm hearing from you is, is is yes, and I'm sure you'd come to us and say you wouldn't be, and we'd try try and find every single thing we can to try and make sure that we are safe. But you're saying that we are going to be safe. We're safe now. Okay. You know, and, and again, you know, nobody can predict what this this community is going to be faced with. You know, do I want more stations, more personnel? Absolutely. Sure. So does the police department. So sure. does public works. Sure. You know, uh, closing stations has an impact on our service delivery. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's without question. Uh, and would I like to see particularly station 10 and station 7 open? Absolutely. I mean, those are those are integral parts of our service delivery model. I do the best I can with the dollars I have. Right. And at you know, if I don't have the dollars, I got to look at options. Absolutely. And Chief, I mean, I mean, when we say are we safe, and you, you made the comment that we could we could be safer. We could always be safer. Absolutely. I mean, and we could we know. could I mean we could, we could say we need five more additional stations to make this this community safer. And 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 I think you know one of the council members at our last meeting said you can't put a price on a human life. You can't. Well, okay, but but then maybe we should have a four person engine crew on every street corner. Dwight, I, you're going to look at it differently if it's your family, your home. Trust I, me, I, 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 people are up in arms over this. I, I, re, I really feel for the citizens on this one. I'm sorry, I do. I, okay. I, I understand, but, okay. but I'm mean, saying, I mean, how far do you take it? You could have a four-person engine crew on every street corner, well, and then okay. people would be much safer. Chief Hernandez, you're, you're the expert. What would the recommend, recommendation be from FIRE? You are the expert, not us. With respect to what stations I would have open, I would open all of them and I would look at some type of alternative staffing for station 19. Every single one of our stations I would keep open with the exception of 19 and I would look at some type of EMS delivery model to, to service that low volume, high risk community. If you had the funds. If I had the funds. Right. Absolutely. The best world. Do I, I don't. I, I mean, I want to make sure, sure we are perfectly clear. I don't want to close stations. Right. And I don't want to lay anybody off. Of course. And, and that's a given. But again, I can only work with the dollars that I am given with the constraints of the labor contracts that I have to work under. And I have to balance those, those two. My first priority is ensuring that Mrs. Smith, our citizens, are adequately protected. Yeah. As such, when we have to close the station, I have to move the chess pieces around to better serve that segment. Do I want more firefighters? Of course. Of course. Of course. Yeah. So, again, will the 1.9 increase our service level? The, the short answer is yes, it will. Because we will have the ability to open a station, increase our floaters, and provide a, you know, an adequate level of service to that community. Can we cover that community when it's browned out? Yes, we can. Sure. That's why I say we are safe. Sure. That's all, all right. I mean, I'm looking at the 1.9. It's the same thing as just saying, well, why don't we use the Southeast Connector money? It's the same thing. And then we're going to do the lump sum covers for a year. We'll be back here another year. We're looking at for new uh, things. It's, it's just, we're looking for lump, one lump sum for the entire year. I mean, that's one of the things I was looking at for the planning fees. And there's 400000 there. That could probably fund two or three firefighters, right? But it's, uh, I'm looking at the chief and saying, do you want to have this conversation again next year with the guys that are sitting on the edge of their seats saying they're going to possibly get laid off like a grant or something? I hate doing that. I hate seeing that. And so, you know, it's, it's being safe. Of course, we can be safer. I'm trying to see, you know, with, with your budget and, and with us trying to find other ways of, of getting more firefighters going. That's why I'd like to see these other two get set up in place. You know, at least that's two less than what we're going to have to deal with next month. You know, it's this process, you know, but uh, I mean, again, I, I don't know if the one time fund from the street funds is going to cover it and fix us. Uh, I don't think it will as much. I would like to like for it to go that way, but uh, I'm not in it for seeing a one time shot. Well, if and then you not okay. knowing that RTC is going to be able to do it. All right. Is that? Okay. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? 
All in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, wait. Those opposed say no. So it's 5 2. Okay, one down, eight to go. <laughs> The next item we've got. Can, can, I, can I just make a, a tell me which way it went? <laughs> can I, just make a, I almost needed to have the motion read again because we've kind of gotten a little <laughs> sideways there. Um, oh, wait a minute. No. Yeah, we'll can we bring that motion back minute. again? Wait a minute. The motion was not. What was the motion? It, it was my motion you voted to, to, to take the 1.9 out of the street fund. Out of the right. street fund and and so I was in the. How you did made you the motion and you voted, and that was five. To, to so Hillary three. seconded it, and no yeah, one. And, and she voted. To, she voted to take it, and then now it went to five two, and we're not doing it. five no's and two yeses. Correct. Right. And now, Thank you. We will not be bringing forward today, that option for the budget hearing. Right. This is tough for an old man. Well, I, I guess it wouldn't. Uh, if we didn't care, it wouldn't be so spirited. So. Okay. All right. Now let's look at the hundred thousand for but course. Mr. Mayor, could I, could I just still back on that one? We heard a couple of people say, but but I am um, all for public safety, and I would say I'm I'm I share the top of that list with anyone else who is in favor of public safety. To to make the suggestion that voting any other way suggests that some of us are not in favor of public safety um, is not um, in a fair or accurate. Um, comparison or statement. I don't disagree. All right. It's a little confusing around here. But now, let's now go to court service review. Mr. Mayor, this was the item that was the exploration of delivery of services based on data-driven decisions by a potential outside consultant for the Public Works and Parks Department and specifically addresses fleet in the Public Works area. I'd like to do that, but I think we need to look at buyer. And even if we have money, you know, salary savings, you told me we had salary savings to get some firefighters out the door. Is there other salary savings to start doing this? I mean, we just have been faced with very difficult decisions and no data. <laughs> and this is what this is going towards. I'm not sure that studying fleet is the highest priority, frankly. I, I have tremendous concern about parks, uh, um, but maybe fire. So I, I don't know. What, why, uh, why fleet? Uh, can we do more? <laughs> this? That is certainly council's decision to recommend I, to us what we should move forward with looking at. Yeah, I mean, I think this is something we've been trying to do for quite some time now. and. I think there's substantial savings that we can see here. Um, so I think, I think spending the money to explore this is very worthwhile. And I, and, uh, I mean, I do think we could see some substantial savings. And, and, just, and just to clarify for the council, this is not just fleet. Um, there would be multiple things that we would ask them to look at. Just in public works, or could we start working on fire so also? Parks too. Th this, would, oh. this would focus on Public Works and Parks and Rec would, would be the two departments that this would look at. Is there any ability to look at fire and start doing that? What are you looking at in fire? I, I actually have a conference call with, I have a conference call tomorrow, in fact, with uh, ICMA. It's the public safety, I, I actually have it right here. Hang on a second. I have a, a conference call tomorrow with the ICMA Center for Public Safety Management to, to discuss that very issue in looking at the fire department, the fire delivery model that we have. And so once I have that conversation with them, I will be able to bring back more information um, on that to this council. But as of today, I'm, I'm not prepared okay. to, to give council oh. any information on okay. that. Okay. Before the end of the fiscal year on yes. that? Okay. Yes. Then I'll make the motion we go with the core services review, starting with fleet and then looking into That's other correct. public works and then parks. Second. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those that opposed, no. Motion carries you down. Parking drop. I think, I think putting any contingencies is a good idea, and I think 
if staff can bring back the whatever the program is to us as far as the purchase of the garage, and we can look at it then. I'll second. Uh, so that's a motion. Yeah. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Those in Yeah, I think I think staff what staff's presented is, is acceptable at this time. I think I think we're doing the most we can with what we've got and the resources that we have. So I would I would move that we move forward with that. Second. Second. Well, Discussion. with with still some um, reiteration of the tremendous savings that we have actually realized with um, the management from the right. from legal staff. Um, not insignificant by any means the savings they've brought forward. They've saved us a ton of money. All in favor say aye. I had a discussion aye. real quick. Excuse me? Discussion. Yes, sir. Uh, before we call. Sure. Earlier I heard a uh, comment from Councilwoman uh, Breckis regarding uh, possible, and, and as I think uh, uh, the manager weighed in as well, with uh, a risk uh, position. I want to try and revisit that as that and to see if that position would, I, I think, would be moved from the attorney's office to under the manager to look at a, a new position with that. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Breckis. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not in favor of taking a position away from the city attorney's office at this point. I think, I mean, as everybody has. I mean, we've, we've all the departments have taken their hits, and I, I, I don't. And they've saved us a ton of money right yeah. now. But, but they have a vacancy right now. You see, so I think we can do both. I think we can keep the the legal strength that we have there, and and bring the risk manager, you know, a non-attorney under the city manager and give him some of these strategic resources that we don't have. And I, I, think, I think that's where we need to go. You I, know I a really risk manager that's not an attorney or anything? That's what we have always had. That's the common model. Yeah. Well, I like having a risk manager that is attorney and knows what he's doing. Okay. Uh, manager, really quick, I know you weighed in earlier um, on that. What, was that a, a benefit, or do you not see that as a benefit falling under you? Do you see it just as being fine under the attorney's office? Yeah, I mean, as I stated, as I stated before, I mean, is our risk management function as robust as we would like it to be? No. I mean, would I like to have a dedicated risk manager separate from the attorney's office at some point in time? Yes. I mean, I, mean, I would. And ideally, you would have a risk manager but you would still have the attorney's office involved. I mean, there, there, there. You, you know, there's still litigation. There's claims, um, you know, that you have to litigate. So there's still a role for the city attorney's office, even if you have a risk manager. But again, I mean, I, I can say, I, I can say that about a lot of departments. So you're you know, good. I mean, basically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, mm -hmm. but I guess the question is, we have a vacancy in the city's attorney's office. I, I guess if we don't, you know, move this risk function over. What is it going to be filled with? I, I don't see the, any deficiencies in the city attorney's office in their service levels. Is it going to be a crim division or is it civil? I, I don't. Tracy Chase, Reno City Attorney's Office. It is slated to be civil. We lost um, a planning attorney. We lost a parks attorney. We wa we lost um, the public safety attorney, and uh, we lost our human resources attorney. I've only filled three of those positions. So we are working long hours to try to maintain the service delivery to this council. So if you do take that position away from the city attorney's office, I would anticipate there would be delay in services because staff really can only work at that high level so long. Well, I, and I go ahead. And I, the only reason there's a vacancy is just because of the, the buyout, right? I mean, Cor just to keep, to keep within your budget? Correct, and truthfully, we were holding it uh, just through this budgetary process because we cannot lose any more staff in our office. We're down to the very bottom of staffing levels. Okay. Um, All right, I, have a, I do have a motion. I do have a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those that oppose, no. Motion carries. Downtown Pride Program. Somebody give me a motion. So moved. Have motion, second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those that oppose, no. Motion take. <laughs> Unanimous uh, room tax allocations. Chair will entertain a motion. Go ahead. Uh, I brought this up 
right? And mm -hmm. I, I didn't have any specific recommendations. I just wanted discussion and examination because this is a rather piecemealed out revenue source that's earmarked. And I think all the earmarks are on the table in these days. So I didn't see anything I had any specific um, concerns about. I mean, I, I, I am concerned that, um, you know, the parks budget is not getting what it needs to be getting. And this showed that it's one-tenth of the parks budget. So the rest of the parks budget is general fund. Chair will entertain a motion to accept uh, the recommendation of the staff. Huh? No, it's just adopting the mayor's, the manager's recommendation. It is. Motion in the second. All in favor say aye. aye. Those that oppose, no. Motion carries unanimously. SUP fee reduction. I think it was brought up earlier regarding uh, the planning fee schedule and uh, Councilman Chivi's um, seeing that uh, SUPs have a huge issue or a concern with small businesses and if there's a way we can reduce that to what's already been reduced. Um, and I, I was kind of looking at uh, what that may be if, if staff had already looked at that during the break. Fred Trenier, Community Development Director, and uh, what was brought up was that it looked like the, the fee had dropped about 25% and a recommendation that was thrown out was about 50%, which would bring it to approximately $2,500 instead of the, the $3,700 fee that's being proposed right now. And what's the budget impact on that, if we, if we do that? Uh, we we probably get uh, we probably receive about fifteen in the year fifteen to twenty. So uh, oh, so it's minimal. It, it's minimal. It's minimal. And plus, we're looking to address some of the triggers in the code. And so the triggers in the code uh, would address uh, some of the the requirements of the SUP. Um, it, we're looking at it's, it's a minimal. Uh, impact and this helps small business dramatically I can't tell you I mean the majority of what I do really yeah. deals with a lot of this so okay great. so chair motion. entertain a motion second. excuse me second which one mr. mayor I would just ask you could actually combine the SUP fee reduction with the fee payment schedule and the, the skating fees if you could do that all in one motion I would think okay so uh, just rec recommend those those changes to to the fee schedule, the SUP fee, and then adding in the skating fees. Do I have a motion? Do we go over the skating fees? No. We're putting them back in. Okay. I'm sorry for Put, putting, yeah, putting Put, them back in the fee schedule. They yeah. were taken out. Oh, okay, to put them back in. Was okay. the fee as proposed, pardon my interruption, um, for the special use permit acceptable to council, as Fred stated, or are we looking to further reduce it? I'd accept that. Okay. The 50% reduction? Yeah, okay. 25 Thank you. All right, so the SUP fee and the fee payment and the including the skate fees, give me a motion. That's true, and the skate fees are not unchanged from 14. I mean, That's they're just right. throwing back in. That's right. right. Correct. So moved. Mo I got a motion. Do I have second. a second? I have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those that oppose no, motion carries unanimously. Redevelopment agency. Mr. Dorch. Motion to accept the staff. Do I have a second? I'm gonna what, what was the motion? I'm sorry. It has, yeah, accept staff's recommendations and have them bring that back to the budget meeting. Okay, I have second. a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Those that oppose, no. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That is all the direction we need as the Office of Management and Budget to proceed to the May 20th tentative budget hearing where you will adopt the budget. Um, I understand there are a few items that need to come back before. Sorry, Councilman. No, I'm sorry. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, I understand the reason that our budget adoption is scheduled in the afternoon is because many years ago there was an individual who liked to go, or maybe some individuals who liked to go to Sparks and then Reno. So Sparks adopts in the morning and then Reno adopts in the afternoon. But I don't think anyone really does that. And, um, and you can watch it on TV now. And, and, and that was just something someone thought why we always do in the afternoon. I was wondering if we could move this to 1.30. Is that the time that I was? 
That would actually work Any better. discussion from anybody else? Comments? Thank you. Okay. How about a motion? My motion. Do I have a second? Motion made and seconded. Discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Those that oppose, no. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll so see you we'll at the next. So we at 1.30 on the 20th. Mm -hmm. All right. Any public comment cards? My favorite, mo my favorite motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Those that oppose don't count. This meeting's adjourned.